Curse of the Fae, Fae Wild Series Book 2, written by W.J. May, narrated by Kathleen Star Hall. Who do you trust when you can't trust yourself? Adelina knows nothing about herself, save for her name and the fact that untold power dwells inside her. Being pursued by a shadowy figure revealed Fae magic she didn't know she had. Magic that makes her a member of the prestigious and notorious King's Blade, an elite force set on protecting the Fae King and his kingdom. Her new training comes at the expense of her only friendship with the striking Bracken, a friendship she hoped would become more. Except King's Blade are forbidden to marry, their entire lives given over to their devotion to King and Realm. With her magic inaccessible, it seems less like a blessing and more like a curse. But... When a mysterious stranger shows up with a hunger that might destroy the entire Fey realm, she knows they are somehow connected. Will she uncover the answers needed to solve the mystery of herself and her enemy, or will the Fey realm fall, bite by bite? Prologue A screech rent the night, pain buffering Lyra's sensitive ears. The sound rose from a black maw, highlighted by shining white teeth surrounded by glossy drool. The creature was like nothing the Fae King had ever encountered, its skin a shiny midnight black, its body truncated like a drop of ink that had grown a set of four slender limbs to drag itself across the landscape. The thing was all mouth, no other features discernible in its blackness. It lunged for him, teeth clacking together, as its jaw closed over and over, hoping to take a bite out of him. Lars spun backwards, his diamond blade flashing in his hand as he swung and connected, slicing through tendons to sever one of the creature's limbs. The leg twitched before it dissolved into a black pool, the liquid sliding across the ground. Lyra watched in horror as it was absorbed back into the creature. Its severed leg regrew in a matter of seconds, and the beast leapt at him again, intact once more. Another screech echoed from behind him, and he looked over his shoulder to see an identical creature advancing. Lyre dodged through the trees, attempting to put some distance between himself and his pursuers. The forest around him was dense, and a quick leap had him pulling himself onto a branch. He ran forward on nimble feet, jumping from one branch to another on a neighboring tree. He froze, taking a moment to look down at where he thought he'd find his attackers, disappointed by his flight but the ground below him was bare, and it wasn't until he heard the scratch of fingers on bark that he realized the blasted bees were climbing the tree below him. They scurried up the wide trunk, teeth gnashing, drool overflowing from their evil-looking mouths. They scrambled onto the branch where he stood, moving determinedly in his direction. The forest rustled around him, and he heard a shout from the distance, a familiar feminine scream of fury. Taking a deep breath, he dropped suddenly, hurtling toward the ground, only his strength and almost unnatural balance saved him from breaking a bone on his descent. Lyra hit the ground hard but landed on his feet. He set off in the direction of the shout, his diamond blade winking in the sunlight as he ran. The forest rustled around him, the ground shifting as her magic flowed through it, twisting and transforming the woods on all sides. Lyra did not stumble, his movements as sure as ever, until two gnashing maws burst from the brush ahead of him. They snarled in tandem their black bodies slick voids, their teeth sharp as his own blade. Twin screeches from behind told Lyre his enemies from earlier had caught up with him. Surrounded by four of the nasty creatures, he knew escape was unlikely. Maybe if I cut them to ribbons, they won't be able to regenerate so easily. Lyre moved like a whirlwind, his blade held before him as he slashed furiously at his foes. He flowed through his forms, the sword an extension of his will, but the beasts weren't content to let him destroy them. They fought back, lunging forward, leaping at him, their jaws snapping. One caught his leg, shredding his breeches and rendering the skin with teeth like razors. Tension filled him, battering the comb he drew on during battle. He could hear screeches in the distance, reinforcements for the beasts who were bent on ripping him apart. The forest whipped and snapped around him, her magic still flowing but something about this fight felt different than ones they'd faced before. It was sudden, ferocious, and seemingly without motive. How did these creatures reach the realm? And who do they belong to? Those weren't his only questions, but they were at the forefront of his mind. Another jaw snapped around his arm, 
nearly biting through bone, and Lyle let out a scream of agony before bashing the creature against the nearest tree to knock it loose. He slashed furiously, cutting one of the beasts in half completely, but before the halves were even foot apart, they liquefied enough to reach toward each other, pulling themselves back together and knitting up the seam so well it was invisible in seconds. It was becoming evident that he would not be able to slash his way out of the situation. One of the creatures leapt for him, and he held up his hand, magic flowing through him. He propelled a blast of air at the creature, deflecting it, then flicked his wrist, attempting to set the beast aflame. Its skin sputtered and ran as it let out a cry of pain. Lyre watched it melt into a puddle, then aimed his fire magic at the others, smiling as each of them melted into an ink-black puddle. His breath was ragged, his muscles fatigued, but before he could sheathe his blade, he heard the nearest puddle begin to bubble and pop. As he watched, aghast, the creatures reformed themselves until the balls of skinny limbs and teeth were once again biting and snapping at his hide. Lyre let out a curse, then took off at a run, realizing they'd underestimated their foe. These creatures are a product of magic, a powerful magic like I've never seen. His powers alone wouldn't defeat them, so he ran for her, the one he knew would never stop fighting. He cleared the trees and stumbled into the meadow where she stood, her hair flying around her head, seeming to crackle like fire as her power ran through every part of her. Lyre was hit by a pride so fierce it humbled him. His mate was the most magnificent creature to have ever graced the web, and his love for her was the bedrock of his existence. Elspeth curled her arm, and mimicking her motion, a root burst through the ground, tangling itself around the snarling creature lunging in her direction. With her other hand she pushed out in front of her, and from her feet sprang a brush of thorns that twisted rapidly away from her, hitting another of the beasts head-on and knocking it off course. She swung around, her motions fast and sure, using her powers over the land to mold and manipulate it to defend herself. The wild landscape around them was teeming with vibration from her formidable magic. All around him the world was erupting with greenery, battling with the gnarling black creatures. Lyre got as close as he could, hacking and slicing through wet skin, his speed making him a blur, but no matter how fast he was, how hard he fought, the fiends were relentless. Seeing an opening in the whirlwind of green, Lyle leapt to the gap to land at her side. Elspeth greeted him with a grin, fire in her eyes, and the knowledge that he was made for this woman flooded him. Then all his attention returned to the swarm of dark creatures that were ripping their way through the brambles and roots around them, their needle-like teeth snapping in strong jaws. As awe-inspiring as his mate was, Lyle feared that she'd finally met her match. He grabbed her hand, squeezing it, they were more powerful together, and it would take every ounce of their combined strength to drive back their foe. Sudden darkness fell, blacking out everything but the glowing white teeth of the beast. They reformed themselves from many frenzied snapping maws to one. One wide smile full of sharp, blood-caked teeth. Thick strands of glistening drool dripped between them as the mouth began to laugh. La sat up suddenly, eyes wide, as the dream shattered around him. His skin was slick with sweat his chest heaving. He fell back against his mattress, his fingers opening and closing reflexively as he got his bearings. It was a dream, he realized, swinging his legs over the side of the bed and standing up, needing to feel something solid beneath his feet. Lyre closed the distance between himself and the doors that opened onto the balcony. It was still dark outside, and as he stepped out into the dimness, he felt a chill go through him. The king in the Fey realm was unaccustomed to the fear that was riding in his belly. The dream had unsettled him, and he longed for the dawn. Her rosy fingers had yet to peek from behind the horizon, so the unsettled feeling remained. From Exaria's highest tower he could see over the capital city and its walls and onto the forest beyond. It was too dark to see it now, but he knew it lurked in the distance, its menace still palpable. The Fey wilds were to be avoided an area where his magic could fail to penetrate. He could remember feeling only disquiet when looking upon the wilderness, as if he could sense its contempt for him and his kind. Lyre had managed to carve his kingdom from the wilds, but it had not been a willing thing, and he'd always believed the wilds watched and waited, looking for any opportunity to reclaim the land for its own. His fingers curled around the stone banister, gripping it tightly. Blackness turned to grey, then began to fade to the deep purple of a bruise 
as the hours passed. He could feel something calling to him from the wilds, something warm and seductive, something he'd never felt before. Or have I? Lyre clutched his head, wondering suddenly if he were under some spell. He knew he couldn't trust anything having to do with the wilds and the secrets they held, but the dreams had become near constant now, tugging on things inside him that felt half-remembered. Like the one he'd wakened from this night, the others had featured the same overgrown landscape. The same beautiful woman with hair fire and eyes so lighter brown, they were almost golden. But he didn't know the woman or the place, and everything was tinged with a sinister edge that made the dreams feel almost foreign. The covenant is broken, a voice whispered in his head, causing him to drop his arms and stiffen. The memory of the smiling mouth waiting to engulf them filled his mind. Lyre turned away and left the balcony, closing the doors behind him, and wishing he could as easily shut away the wilds and the uneasy thoughts they engendered. It was morning now, time to behave like a king. There was a threat facing his kingdom, and this time it was not the wilds, but something that had taken place in his own capital city. An explosion of light bright enough to be seen through Exaria had not gone unnoticed. He'd felt it the second it had detonated, felt it in his body, his heart contracting in his chest, his muscles spasming as if activated on reflex. Could the dreams he'd been experiencing be related to the magic? Lyre wasn't a man who put much store in coincidence. It was difficult to do so when magic crawled the web in such abundance. The king in the Fey realm also possessed the most powerful magic by multiple orders of magnitude, but the blast had been a result of almost unimaginable power. If it was true, and the magic was a result of one young woman, then he had plenty of reasons to be wary of her. It could be a trap putting himself in the same space as magic that potent. Lyon knew he should talk to the female himself, but something told him to hold back. He'd been struggling lately, feeling like there was something he'd forgotten. The feeling stalked his heels, keeping him distracted, preventing him from his usual decisive decision-making. But the remnants of the dream haunted him, galvanizing him to act lest he lose all momentum. Lyre sat himself at his desk and reached for a scrap of parchment, then his ink. He scrawled a message to one of his most faithful, closing the missive and pressing his ring into a circle of wax to seal it. His course of action decided. Lyre reached into the bowl of fruit on his desk to pluck out a ripe berry. The moment his fingers touched the fruit, the memory of the evil grin full of teeth rose inside him and he dropped it. His appetite gone. Chapter 1 My name is Adelina, and I am a king's blade. Adelina sighed, letting the mantra that had been circling her mind since she'd woken up before dawn slip away. No matter how many times she tried to soothe herself with the fragments of the personal history she'd managed to uncover, she couldn't deny that questions outweighed answers by a margin that could crush her. She sat on a polished wooden bench in a large hall carved of wood and highlighted with gold staring at the floor. The white stone had been buffed until it glowed. Adelina went through the catalogue of questions in her mind as she waited for whatever was about to happen. I have a name, but no history. No memory of family, of childhood friends. Nothing but a woman who looks just like me, save for her eyes. It hadn't been long since she'd awoken, with no memory of who or where she was. She'd thought she'd recover what she'd lost in the capital of the Fey realm. But that journey had only ended in more mysteries. Who is the woman who looks enough like me to be my twin? How did our coming together create such a powerful explosion of magic? And how did that magic end up inside me, or has it always been there? Suppressing a groan, she looked up, her eyes landing on the stylized portrait of the Fay King, done in stained glass. The window dominated the far end of the hall, the morning sun shining through it, lighting up his crown and dappling the hall with golden light. The effect was awe-inspiring, and finally the thoughts that had chased each other through her mind for hours slowed down enough for her to breathe. She scanned the hall, noticing that others were filing in to fill the pews around her. Two black-clad guards had deposited her here over a quarter of an hour ago, when the hall was empty and still. Now other men and women, most in the same inky black as the guards, were entering and talking softly to one another as they took their seats. A few grey uniforms were interspersed among the black, ones that looked like the clothing she wore. 
the dove grey robes with white swords embroidered down both sleeves, and a white crown sewn into the chest, were more comfortable than the dress she'd worn during what she'd come to term her awakening. But she missed her breeches and the mobility they provided. If I have to run in these robes, I'll likely trip over myself within a few steps. I hope I'm not late, a breathless voice muttered. Adelina turned to see a plump girl a few years younger than herself scrambling to sit down beside her. I don't want to earn a punishment, she said, then smiled in Adelina's direction. Oh, you're new, she said as she continued her stream of consciousness conversation. At least I haven't seen you around here before. I'm Pigeon, pleased to meet you. The young woman's whirlwind introduction caught Adelina off guard. I'm sorry, did you say your name was Pigeon? Her companion nodded with a quiet giggle. <laughs> Father always said I reminded him of the pigeons on our farm. Fat, docile, and always cooing. Adelina's eyes widened, but the other woman didn't seem to take the description as an insult. She hastily tucked a lock of chestnut hair behind her ear and straightened, eyes facing forward. Adelina noticed that a hush had descended on the rest of the hall. Her eyes flicked forward as a door to the left of the stained-glass window opened. A square-jawed woman with a shock of red hair in a long braid down her back barreled in, draped in the black uniform of the king's blade. Her ice-blue eyes took in the room, landing on Adelina before she began to speak. "'I am here to remind you of the importance of your training.' Every eye was on the woman, and her stance said that she was well acquainted with that fact. She began to pace, her motions dynamic without being fidgety. You are the blade that stands between the realm and darkness. A blade must be sharp, to cut back the encroachment of our enemies and prune out any evil before it takes root. She slammed her fist into her hand to accentuate her point. Adelina was tempted to lean over and ask Pigeon if the woman was the head gardener, but something told her that would not be a good idea. Whatever claws itself out of the wilderness, an unwelcome birth into civilization must be driven back, exposed to the light and set to rot, burned, hacked away, scorched until nothing can grow there again. She's talking about the wild, Adelina realized as the woman stared down her congregation. She straightened, a thread of unease working its way into her belly. You are the blade, and you must be sharp, honed, lethal, and that is why you are here, to train, to learn to harness the power inside you and channel it for the good of the realm and the glory of his kingdom. There were murmurs from the pews around her. Adelina saw their rapt faces and realized that many gathered here believed in their sacred mission as a member of the King's Blade. But how did I wind up here? Since she'd woken up alone with no memory of her past and only a coin pouch with a name that hadn't turned out to be hers, Adelina was determined to discover who she was. That mission had led her to the capital and a friendship of sorts with Bracken, the fey soldier who had tried to protect her. But he couldn't keep her from being discovered after last night, when she'd finally made contact with a shadowy figure that had been pursuing her. The power they'd unleashed had made her a target, and now she was here, conscripted into the ranks of the fey king's most elite force. If what Bracken said about the king's blade was true, she was now a member of a powerful group of magic users whose undying loyalty made them the king's right hand. The academy was a place many might aspire to, but to Adelina, it was just another roadblock keeping her from discovering who she was. But if it's true, if what that statue thing showed is correct and I do have magic powers, then maybe they can help me. Maybe I can use my magic as a tool to recover my memory. She would have never thought it possible having believed herself to have only the limited powers of an ordinary fae. She could summon fire and emit light, but nothing more specialized than that, until last night. The woman clapped her hands together and Adeline tuned back into her speech, noticing that the redhead was watching her again. We must work harder, redouble our efforts, and prepare to give everything in the defense of the realm. If we fail, then darkness will reign. Remember that, my blades, and stay sharp. Stay sharp. Her words were echoed by solemn voices all around her. The redhead nodded once, then turned on her heel and exited via the same door she'd entered through. Adelina looked around and saw that the others were rising to shuffle toward the wide double doors behind the rows. She stood and followed Pigeon, who was holding her belly with a 
look of woe on her face. I hate that our devotional is always before breakfast. Usually I try to sneak out a little bit of last night's dinner and tuck it away in my room to nibble on in the morning. But I overslept this morning and barely had time to dress, let alone shove leftovers in my mouth. Pigeon talked like she had no need to breathe in between her words. Adelina knew that trait could be annoying on some, but the plump woman had something about her that made her ceaseless conversation somehow charming. Did you say you were from the capital? she asked, swibbling around to smile at Adelina as the line slowly progressed toward the exit. I didn't say, Adelina murmured, holding back a grin. I'm not, Pigeon said with a wink, then laughed. But that's probably obvious. Father used to say that I am as country as a wagon wheel. He also said I didn't have the sense of a bumblebee, but I can't blame him for that. Bumblebees are actually very smart. I once kept one on a string as a pet for a whole summer. He'd take naps on my shoulder and... Pigeon's words were cut off as a fey male in a black uniform grabbed Adelina's arm and pulled her out of line. Torval wants to see you. Adelina saw Pigeon's eyes widen at the name, and the plump girl promptly turned around and shut her mouth. Nerves filled her as she was led away from the line and back toward the front of the hall. She tried to tug her arm from the man's grip, but he held her firm as he guided her through the door next to the stained glass window and into a long hallway festooned with high windows. The rays of morning sunlight crisscrossed above her as she was marched down the hall to the door at the end. Through that door and then another, down this hall and that one, they traveled and Adelina quickly lost her bearings. She wished Bracken was there because he'd always managed to make her feel safe, even when things were at their worst. He's the one who knows me best in the whole realm, she realized, missing him with an ache that was too deep after only one night apart. The final door opened and her guardian gave her a soft shove, then closed it behind her. The room was empty, save for a few pieces of furniture. She took a seat in one of the wooden armchairs in front of the fireplace, which was cold and empty. Then she waited. It wasn't easy being alone with her thoughts in a foreign place where she knew no one, not even herself. The path she'd been set on might be enough to excite the average fay, but she wasn't interested in earning her glory through some powerful, elite, magical fighting force. All she wanted was to learn who she was, feel as if she knew herself. And as fantastic as the King's Blade might be, Adelina didn't feel like she belonged there. Once again, she hadn't been given a choice. She'd had no choice in losing her memory, no choice in her journey to the capital, and now no choice but to serve a king she didn't know in a city she couldn't remember. Not being in control of my own life is getting old she thought as her fingers drummed against the armchair. Like now, being forced to wait for the web knows what. She stared into the empty fireplace and worried about what would happen next. Chapter 2 With nothing to do but wait, Adelina took stock of her surroundings. The room's spartan furnishings told her that it had been set up for function, not comfort. Besides the armchairs near the fireplace, there was a desk with a small stool set near the open window, and next to it a chest of drawers. A table with two benches stood against the other wall, and on that table was a pitcher of water with a few glasses. There was no decoration of any kind, nothing at all to allude to the type of person the room's owner could be. Since arriving in area, Adelina had come to expect fine and lavish furnishings around every corner, but this room was the opposite of lavish and she wondered what sort of person lived such a sterile existence. Her question was answered when the door swung open and in strode the red-haired woman from earlier. She stopped in front of Adelina, crossing her arms and looking her up and down. This must be Torva, she realized, swallowing hard. Why weren't you identified before now? The redhead asked, staring down at her. Adelina was intimidated by the woman who hadn't bothered to sit down before addressing her. She tapped her finger against her arm as she waited for an answer, but Adelina wasn't sure what to say. Letting out a huff, Torva spoke again. You're in your adulthood, but a power like yours should have been identified long ago. Where are you from? Is some fly speck of a village in the hills? Adelina shrugged, not ready or willing to launch into her backstory on demand. Torva's eyes narrowed, then she moved to the table, pouring herself a glass of water. Most King's Blade initiates are found long before now, especially ones with your sizable talents. 
I assume someone was hiding you. An overprotective mother, perhaps? Adelina watched her sip of water, licking her lips. She hadn't eaten or drunk anything since yesterday, and seeing the other woman drinking made her realize her own deprivation. Torva finished off the glass and set it down. Well, you're here now, she said, and your power, although untrained, is enviable. I think there must have been a mistake, Adelina said at last. Maybe that statue thing of yours was wrong. Torva returned to the fireplace and leaned against the dark stone comprising it. The statue is an artifact from long ago, created to pick up on the energy field emitted by fey magic. It is never wrong. Adelina held back a growl of annoyance. Put in this position by a stupid ancient statue. But who am I to complain? That stupid statue probably knows me better than I do at this point. I'm not magical, she insisted. At least not any more than a normal fay. I've never done anything more powerful than light a candle before. And why should we believe you? The words were said quietly, barely above a whisper. But Adelina knew there was menace hidden in them. Because it's the truth, she said, then immediately remembered that it might not be. Maybe I was some fearsome, powerful fay before I lost my memory. How would I know? Torva pursed her lips. Who are you? Adelina, she replied, with nothing else to add. Adelina from where? You're not one for answering questions, are you? Adelina could sense the woman's rising irritation. Your silence breeds suspicion. This woman is not an enemy I would like to have. Adelina took a breath, understanding that she had few options in this situation. She could continue to dissemble and likely make things worse, or she could take a chance and tell the truth. Perhaps Torva would come to believe her, perhaps even be able to help her. I don't know the answers, she said suddenly, choosing the more vulnerable but perhaps less painful option. I have no memory of who I am and where I'm from, save my name. Torva stared at her for a moment, her eyes searching. Then a fell grin began to spread across her face. Very clever, she stalked around Adelina's chair, circling behind it. Adelina turned, fear rising inside her, as Torvo leaned over the back of her chair to grin into her face. Who are you working for? Someone off-world? Adelina could see the woman's fingernails digging into the chair's frame. It will go easier on you if you tell me now. I'm not working for anyone. And I've never been off-world, at least that I know about. Someone with a grudge against the king, eh? Torvo pushed off the back of the chair hard enough to make it shiver. She moved in the direction of the door, and Adelina was suddenly afraid that she'd call in a guard or two. I swear, I'm not working for anyone. Adelina hated the anxiety on display in her own voice, but she wanted the woman to believe her. I don't know who I am. But whoever it is, I promise I am no threat. Torva opened the door and shoved her head out into the hallway. Summon the eye, she yelled, then slammed the door behind her. You have some temerity, I'll give you that, she said, sauntering back to the fireplace. But it won't matter. The eye is all-seeing. Adelina gripped the arms of her chair, not sure what to expect. She'd already told the truth, so she should have nothing to fear. But the way Torva was smirking let her know that whatever or whoever this eye was, it wouldn't be pleasant. There was a scratching sound at the door, and then it opened. In walked a creature with skin the color of ash. A patch covered one eye, the other eye was a milky white, and when it landed on her, Adelina could feel her skin start to crawl. This one is trying to hide her identity from us. She's told me a fiction— that she's lost her memory. I want the truth from her. Torvo gestured in her direction, and Adelina sank down in her chair, wanting to avoid the creature from coming any closer to her. Its head turned slowly in her direction, the single visible eye attaching itself to her as if his gaze had claws. Adelina could feel that gaze digging in under the skin, scratching its way into her skull. The sensation bordered on painful, but the violation hurt more. The eye will see what you're trying to hide, Torva said, almost softly. Adelina thought the fae might be enjoying what was happening. The creature took another step toward her, its eyes still locked in. 
It had the body of a man, but its thick grey skin and sharp features let her know it was no fay, an off-worlder of some kind, with powers I don't understand. A moment later she let out a gasp as it felt like a shovel made of ice cracked its way into her skull. Adelina put her hands on her head to try and block out the invasion, but her movements had no effect. She was defenseless against the eyes on slot. She speaks the truth. The words came out in a low rumble, and suddenly the pain stopped. The tension went out of her, and Adelina flopped backward, flooded with relief. Not possible, Torvo insisted through a grimace. She's hiding something. If she is, she doesn't know what. The creature still looked at her, but his gaze lacked its early intensity. Something is blocking her memories. Adelina gripped the arms of her chair, pulling herself up. What? Torvo ignored her. Remove the block, she ordered, her chin jutting, her air imperious. The door opened, suddenly admitting a black-clad king's blade. King Lyre has summoned you to his side, he announced, then recoiled at the sight of the eye. He hurried back in the direction he'd gone, leaving the door standing open behind him. Torvo let out a sigh, looking down at Adelina, her eyes narrowed. Seems like you've been given a reprieve. For now. But our conversation isn't finished. She strode out the door, her footfalls echoing down the hall until they receded. Adelina looked at the grey-skinned creature, who stared back at her. The notion to thank it entered her mind, but before she could speak, it drifted out the door. She wiped her brow of cold sweat, realizing her hand was shaking. All alone once more, Adelina stood deciding she wanted to be anywhere but the tidy functional room. She poked her head into the hall and, looking both ways to make sure no other surprises were lurking, took an unsteady step through the door. She hadn't gone far before she was stopped by a king's blade. "'You're one of the new recruits,' the female officer said, looking her up and down. "'What are you doing in this area?' "'Torvo summoned me,' Adelina said, wondering if she was about to be shoved into a corner and made to wait for the fierce redhead to return. Poor you, the face said with kind eyes. Well, she let you go, so make use of your freedom while you have it. The officer pointed down a hallway. The mess is that way. Go find yourself some breakfast before they stop serving. Thank you, Adelina said with relief. She scurried in the direction the officer had pointed, holding her belly to stop it growling. The woman's mention of breakfast had made her realize how hungry she was. Turning a corner, she walked down a window-lined corridor. The sun hit her face as she stepped from the shadows, and Adelina blinked, glancing out the window as she passed it. She froze suddenly when she saw figures dressed in military uniforms outside. There was a loose group of a half-dozen fey males, and she recognized the finest set of ears she'd ever seen among them. Bracken! Without hesitating, Adelina gripped the window sill and tugged it up until it was open wide enough for her to climb through. The drop was minimal, into a pair of floral bushes. She managed not to make too much noise. She crouched in the bushes, sizing up the situation, because there was every likelihood that she'd be in for trouble if she were caught outside the academy. The fay Velix was as handsome as ever, his uniform clean and pressed. Every hair on his attractive head was in place. The long, dark locks pulled back into a tight bun, two perfectly pointed ears peeking through. His profile could have been sculpted by the most talented of fey artists, his body formed to be the ideal of male strength and beauty. Adelina's heart beat harder. She approached him, unsure of what sort of greeting she would receive. When they'd parted last night, she'd felt bereft, cut adrift. His reaction to her news, his deflated stance, as she'd been marched away, let her know that he cared but she had no idea how far that sentiment would go once she was initiated into the King's Blade. No time like the present to find out. Chapter 3 Reaching down to scoop up a handful of small pebbles, she took aim at Bracken. She held her breath, not wanting to hit one of the other soldiers by mistake and alert them to her presence. It took several tries before a pebble hit Bracken's exposed hand, making his brow furrow. He brushed his fingers over the spot where the pebble hit, then went back to chatting with his fellow fighting men. Adelina held back a sigh and aimed for the same spot, this time selecting a larger rock. She chucked it with more force, and when it hit his hand, this time he flinched. 
His head turned in the direction of the bushes and Brecken caught sight of her. She watched a slow grin take over his face, warmth filling her. Making an excuse, Bracken headed away from his group, walking past the bushes and around the corner. Adelina retained her cover until she reached the edge of the building and was forced to step out into the open. The moment her foot extended out of the bushes, Bracken reached in and grabbed her arm, fishing her out. She expected him to demand what she was doing there, but instead he pulled her into his arms, holding her tightly. Adelina melted into his embrace, feeling secure enough to let go of the rigidity she'd held on to since meeting the eye. He stroked her hair, then pulled back, his large hands cupping her face. "'What's wrong? What's happened?' Her bottom lip trembled, but before she could speak, the bracken she'd expected reared his head. Dropping his hands from her face to her shoulders, he gave her a little shake. "'And what in the seventeen hells do you think you're doing? Sneaking out of the academy already. You're bound to be caught!' Adelina blinked, catching her breath after his change in reaction. She gently disentangled herself from his grip. I wanted to talk to you. Emotions mixed on Bracken's face. Don't get me wrong. I'm happy to see you, but you don't need any more risk in your life. They're very strict in the King's Blade. The only thing they prize more than discipline is a fanatic loyalty to the King. And since you don't seem to have a fanatic bent, you'd better behave yourself. What about you? I doubt the famed faith forces are any laxer in their requirements of discipline and duty. What are you doing here? Bracken looked down at her, a sheepish expression appearing on his features. Adelina was unaccustomed to the look. I put in for a change of assignment, he admitted. He straightened his jacket collar, his tone wry. I'm now a glorified gopher, carrying messages from the higher ups of the King's Blade to my own commanders and vice versa. She didn't bother to hide her grin. You wanted to keep an eye on me. You need someone looking after you, he pointed out. It's been less than twelve hours and you're already breaking the rules, Lynette. I mean, Adelina. Call me Lena. The abbreviation was close to the name she'd claimed, but wasn't hers. A mixture of who she was and who she turned out to be. The warmth she experienced at seeing him again spread, lighting up her insides. He cared enough to ask for a transfer to what must be one of the most boring assignments possible. Lena heard a door open behind her and looked over her shoulder to see two fae in identical black uniforms heading away from the academy in the other direction. Her smile faded. A member of the Kingsblade was not allowed to marry nor start a family. Their entire lives were tied up in their devotion and service to the fae king. That left little room for handsome soldiers with protective streaks. Bracken tracked her gaze and grabbed her around the waist, pulling her back so that the bushes blocked her from view again. His eyes flicked to all points around them, making certain no one was around to catch her. His concern pricked at her, making her feel worse. Something happened earlier, she said, suddenly desperate to push those thoughts away. I met their leader. I mean, I think she's their leader. A fey named Torva? Bracken nodded, and she continued. She didn't believe that I'd lost my memory, insisting that I had some ulterior motive in keeping my powers hidden and was descending on the capital. When I insisted it was true, she brought in someone else. Something else. Something called the Eye. Bracken shivered. I've heard the rumors, but never seen him myself. What was it like? Like nothing I've ever felt before. She rubbed her arms at the memory. It wasn't fey, not even close. It was like something formed from grey clay. But the sculptor stepped away before it was done, giving it an unfinished quality. Her words were soft, her eyes staring off into the distance as she recounted the experience. He's a hellspawn, Brecken said quietly, from one of the seventeen hell realms. I have no idea how Torva got hold of it, but it has abilities no fey has yet to exhibit. Why it stays in the Fey realm. I have no earthly clue. I felt it clawing its way into my mind. It was Lena's turn to shiver. I don't know what it saw, but the eye told Torva that something was blocking the memories. She seemed to think he could remove the block, but she was summoned by the king before that could happen. Bracken's brow furrowed. I'm not certain I like the thought of that creature fiddling about in your mind. That makes two of us. 
She let out a frustrated breath. But I'm not certain I have any say in the matter. Maybe it's a good thing, Brecken said, his tone softening. A good thing? She said, her shock evident in her voice. It's a good thing that creature is going to mangle my mind. A good thing that the head of the most elite magical fighting force in the realm is hell-bent on branding me a traitor. That's not what I meant, he placated her, patting her on the arm. You've been trying to remember who you are. Maybe the eye can help with that. Not that he'd be my first choice, but at least there's an option now where none existed before. Maybe I don't want to know, she muttered, wondering for the first time if determining her identity would truly free her as she'd hoped. As you've pointed out, I have a knack for finding trouble. What if Torva is right? What if I'm some sort of spy or infiltrator? What if I'm here for all the wrong reasons? It wasn't something she'd considered much before. I don't feel like a traitor, but how would I know if I were? Lena ran her hands through her hair, suppressing a groan. Her frustration was almost overwhelming. Hey, it's okay, Bracken said, his tranquil tone attempting to calm her. You don't need to worry about that. You're not evil. You couldn't be. How do you know that? She responded churlishly. How could you possibly? Because you can't hide something like that, not forever. It comes out eventually. Lena stared up into his face and noticed his expression had turned grim. Bracken's eyes had a faraway look. She didn't think he was talking about her anymore. What do you mean? He took a step backward, his head turning as he scanned the area around him. But this time, she didn't think he was looking at their surroundings. His eyes had a faraway cast. Something gives it away. A glance, maybe. An expression that doesn't stay hidden long enough. A deadness around the eyes, even. You sound like you're speaking from personal experience. Bracken frowned. Maybe I am. And what I've learned is, evil always outs itself. But you haven't shown any hint that you're anything more than a confused soul who's maybe a little lost and maybe a little too trusting. You're not evil. I hope you're right. When have I ever been wrong? He shot back. His earlier lapse in mood vanished. His cheeky smile raised her spirits, and she held her tongue. Her stomach, however, refused to keep quiet. What was that? Brecken said, looking around them with wide eyes. Surely some fearsome beast of the wilds hasn't made its way to the capital to destroy us all. Lena punched him in the arm. I'm hungry, and I'm pretty sure I missed breakfast. He nodded. The kitchen is likely closed by now, but don't worry, I know where I can find some grub. You stay tucked in here. He gently placed her back inside the bushes that bordered the academy's outer wall. I'll be right back. Hey, she called, but was unable to raise her voice for fear of being caught. She watched as he hurried away, his lightning speed ensuring he was out of sight in seconds. That damn man. Despite her current irritation with him, she had to admit Brecken was getting on her nerves much less frequently than before. The Velux had grown on her, perhaps too much. Five minutes passed before he returned, minutes that had started to drag out into hours for Lena. She was almost on the verge of climbing back in the window without her breakfast when he finally reappeared. Here, he said, shoving something wrapped in a cloth napkin into her hand. Where did you get this? she asked, unwrapping the bundle to reveal some dried fruit and a handful of candied nuts. From my old friend Roxy. She always has sweets tucked in a drawer in her office, and I still have her key. Her stomach knotted, chasing her appetite away. Why would you have a key to a King's Blade's office? She's not officially King's Blade. More of a court functionary. You see, she's beneath Twelva, sure, but also beneath the steward of the court in sort of a dual role as... Could we save this stroll through the organizational chart of the Fey hierarchy until later? Just what is your relationship with this Roxy woman? Relationship? He asked coolly, his brows raising. We're friends. And do I detect a note of jealousy in your voice? You wish, she grumbled, then shoved a piece of dried fruit into her mouth and chewed it mulishly. Someone has an inflated ego. And someone shouldn't talk with her mouth full, he replied. 
the corners of his mouth turning up. With another glance around him, he gave her a decisive nod. Right, time for you to go back inside. I could go. You could get me out of the city. I could head south, away from the capital. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Bracken shook his head. They know about you now, and they don't look too kindly on deserters. Your only chance is to stay and see what you can learn. Despite her sudden urge to flee, she knew he was probably correct. Besides, I've got nowhere and no one to run to. She walked her way through the brush to the window she'd climbed out of. Bracken knelt and held out his hand to give her an assist, but she pulled herself easily over the frame. Looking back, she rested her elbows on the sill. Will I see you again? Bracken nodded. I'll be around, keeping my eye on you. There was so much she wanted to say, but in the end, she said nothing. Lena straightened, closing the window and starting off down the hallway again. She wasn't sure where to go, but was confident someone would give her orders soon enough. Her last moments of freedom were about to be behind her, but as she walked through the Academy's corridors, she understood that she'd never been free. Not for a moment since she'd awakened with no memory. Destiny had set her on a path of discovery, one she seemed helpless to escape. She was trapped, not only by circumstances, but by her body, one that might not belong to her. After her conversation with Tolva, she couldn't help wondering if her consciousness now, after her memory loss, was anything like who she'd been before the block had appeared. The only way I'll know for certain is to have the block removed. And to do that, Lena shivered, not wanting to think about the eye and the way it had felt when he was inside her mind. He might represent an opportunity to Bracken, but she never wanted to go through that again. My only other choice is to find out more about the magic inside me, if it exists. Perhaps that's the key I need to unlock myself. What I find after that is on me, the real me, whoever she is. Chapter 4 Lena turned over in bed, her eyes screwed tightly closed, her forehead creased with worry. The dream unfolded in her mind, and although she knew it was a dream, she couldn't affect anything within it. She was seeing through eyes that were not her own, traveling around in a body that didn't belong to her. Smoke stung her eyes, but she didn't blink. Leaning over, she stared into the bubbling cauldron until an image appeared. As she watched, its clarity increased, details appearing until she could make out the scene. It was a village, seen from above. Lena could see people walking down the cobblestone streets, calling to neighbors, carrying vegetables, pushing carts filled with children or goods or livestock. The buildings were rustic but well kept, the streets clean and the people cheerful. The image started to shrink as the view shifted and she realized it was climbing, making the village appear smaller, the forest around it appearing to ring the town walls. Still, they climbed until the village was only a blip in the surrounding greenery. The liquid in the cauldron rippled as a wooden spoon stirred its contents. The image disappeared entirely, and when the liquid settled, a familiar reflection appeared, one that looked eerily like her own. The eyes she was seeing through looked up suddenly, and Lena realized she was not alone. Across the cauldron stood an ancient woman covered in what looked like fur and rags. Her nose was long and wart-covered, and her eyes were roomy. The old woman cackled in glee, her hands rubbing together excitedly. The cackle echoed through Lena's brain, and she sat up suddenly, the dream shattering around her. Clutching her chest, she struggled to catch her breath. When she was able to calm herself, she climbed out of bed, smothering a string of curses. I can't even escape in sleep! She moved to the small dresser, which held a pitcher of water in a basin. She poured water into the bowl and bent over to splash it on her face. She rinsed her mouth and popped a mint leaf into it from a small collection she'd found in the top drawer. Fay were blessed with unearthly beauty accompanied by minimal maintenance. Her mint leaf would ensure clean teeth and pleasant breath all day long, for instance, and body odor was practically unheard of. Off-worlders had been known to comment that Fay's sweat smelled as sweet as other races' perfume. But most Fae still prided themselves on their appearance nonetheless, which meant grooming routines remain de rigueur. 
Pulling out her comb, Lena began to brush her hair, counting the strokes as she always did. The atmosphere of the dream clung to her, even if she could no longer remember many of the details. It soured her mood, making her think about everything that was wrong with her situation. At the forefront was her fear of the King's Blade leader and her pet demon. Will the eye be at me again today? Or will Torva devise some other torture for me? It was clear the woman didn't trust her, and she didn't seem like the type to let things lie. Then again, maybe Bracken is right, and the eye can help to restore my memory. Perhaps I should suffer through his invasive techniques after all. Maybe it's worth it. If there's a chance I might know the answers to all these damn questions, like who the woman is who looks so much like me, and whether there really is magic inside me. And the old crone, who is she and what power does she have over all this? Questions tumbled around inside her like always, unanswered. She'd just reached the halfway point when a knock sounded at her door. It was Pigeon with a semi-frantic expression on her face. I'm sorry for interrupting, but if you don't hurry, you're going to be late to class, and that means a punishment. Shoot, Lena muttered, lunging for her grey robes and hurrying behind the screen in the corner to dress as quickly as she could. Thanks for coming to get me. We all need a little help getting adjusted to the routine in the beginning, Pigeon replied, but I've never seen anyone skip breakfast two days in a row. So I got a little worried about you. When Lena reappeared from behind the screen, Pigeon tossed her a peach. I grabbed that from the mess hall for you. You'll have to eat it on the way. Thanks again, Lena told her as they scurried down the hall toward the classrooms. I'm afraid I'm not aware of the schedule around here yet. Yesterday, after her conversation with Bracken, she'd wandered until a matronly-looking woman in a black uniform with a distinctive white lace collar had called out to her while passing in the hallway. You're out of class, the woman had said, looking down her nose at Lena. Why are you out of class? Because I don't know what class I should be in, Lena had replied with a shrug. And I don't know where the classrooms are. The woman had taken hold of her arm and marched her to an office, where she'd put her head together with an elderly fay with a drooping mustache. Between the two of them, they'd managed to assign her a room and arranged a tour of the academy. Classes start tomorrow, the woman had said before shoving her in the direction of a grey-clad younger fay with a disgruntled expression. The fay female had turned out to be her tour guide. She wasn't pleased at being pulled out of her normal rotation to show Lena around. It's considered prestigious to act as the magister's right hand, she said with a sniff. I would have had that position for the rest of the day if you hadn't turned up. Magister, Lena had asked ignoring the other woman's attitude. Her guide let out a loud sigh. <sighs> of course you don't know who the Magister is. You probably came to town on a turnip truck. I walked, actually. I wish there had been a turnip truck. I could have rested my feet and had a meal. The Fae had eyed her, not enjoying their conversation. The Magister is the head of the Academy. I thought that was Torva, Lena replied, confused. No, Mistress Torvet is the current leader of the King's Blade. You really need to get your facts straight if you hope to survive around here. She motioned to a set of large double doors that were closed. That's the mess hall attached to the kitchens. It's only open for two hours in the morning and two in the evening. If you're late, you miss a meal. The woman had kept walking through the entire tour, not stopping once as she'd pointed to the classrooms, offices and the communal baths. Males there, females in here. Lena was almost out of breath by the time they reached her quarters. This is your assigned room. Keep it clean and in good order. Routine inspections can be expected. The Fae had looked her up and down once more, then sniffed again. You might just make it if you buckle down and fall in line. Report to the Sapphire Room at first bell tomorrow. Lena had watched the other woman go, trying desperately to remember which room was Sapphire or Ruby or Garnet or any of the other jewel-related names. She'd failed, so Lena was relieved that Pigeon had dropped by her room. She realized her palms were sweating. I'm nervous, and I bet I have every reason to be. Pigeon skated down the hall, the skirts of her robe swinging around her ankles. Punishments start off easy, but they don't stay that way, she said over her shoulder. On the farm, 
Father used to say watching me do chores was like watching grass grow, but his punishments never went beyond denying us dessert. Her new classmate was growing on Lena. She hid a smile, figuring Pigeon probably talked at twice the speed she did anything else, including jog to class to avoid being late. Lena found herself reining in her own speed to keep pace with the other fae. Still, they managed to squeak through the doorway before the first bell rang out at the end of the corridor of classrooms. The sapphire room, although opulently named, was a small stone chamber with a half-dozen chairs circling a lectern. Hanging above the lectern was a lamp composed of blue glass that threw patterns on the walls and floors. Lena supposed that if she squinted she could imagine herself inside a sapphire. But I would have to squint pretty hard, she thought wryly. Pigeon took one of two empty seats and primly folded her hands in her lap. Lena sat beside her, taking in the faces of the other candidates for the Fey realm's most exclusive fighting force. Beside Pigeon sat a thin, sallow-skinned male whose ears drooped like his shoulders. He was staring at the floor in front of him, seemingly whispering to himself. Next to him was another male, this one with a curly mop of hair that covered his ear tips. His eyes were closed, and he was leaning back in his chair, making Lena think that maybe mornings disagreed with him. Two females made up the rest of the group. They looked enough alike to be sisters, but had long dark hair braided into plates on either side of their long faces. As soon as she noticed they were staring at her, their wide dark eyes moved away, flashing at each other before demurely lowering. She was about to lean over to ask Pigeon to tell her about their classmates when a tall fey male strode into the room, his black robes billowing around him. He reached the lectern and paused, his dark blue eyes making his way round the circle. They landed on Lena and stayed there. "'I see we have a new recruit,' he said, his tone mild. "'I am Raynal, the instructor who will help you hone your magical skills and determine your strengths. Please rise and tell the class who you are.' She stood grappling with how loaded Raynal's question was. "'My name is Adelina. You can call me Lena if you like.' Words abandoned her with no memories to back them up. I look forward to learning with you all. She hurried to finish, dropping back into her seat and trying not to blush red with embarrassment. Pleasure to meet you, Lena, Reynal said, nodding his head. His brown hair showed a few streaks of grey, and the lines on his face marked him as an elder fay. Fay lifespans were incredibly long, however so the instructor could easily number his year in the hundreds or the thousands. Let's go around the circle and introduce ourselves for our new classmate, shall we? Pagella, how about you start us off? And remember, brevity is the soul of wit and a solid introduction. Pigeon beamed in Lena's direction. I'm Pigeon, but you already know that. I didn't know your name, though, which is all because we had the moment in the Great Hall. I thought you told me your name, but I guess you didn't. Reynal gave a polite cough, no doubt to encourage Pigeon to wrap up her introduction. But the plump young woman missed the hint. As she continued to introduce herself, the door opened, and Torva marched in, heading straight for the lectern. Lena held her breath while Torva and Reynal spoke quietly. She could see their mouths moving, but could not hear even the hum of their voices. They're using magic, she realized, making her tense. Torva looked at her, her cold eyes narrowing. Then she left, her footfalls echoing on the stone floor before the door slammed shut behind her. "'If you will,' Raynal interrupted, cutting Pigeon off. "'I believe we need to move on, or we risk spending the entire morning on introductions.' "'Sorry,' Pigeon said cheerfully, no sign of any sheepishness coming from the fave female. The male next to her perked up. "'Moxel, I come from East. My folks are weavers.' I was discovered during our village's annual King's Day testing a year and a half ago. As he breathed heavily from his mouth, Lena realized he was several years younger than her. In fact, everyone in the classroom was younger, save the instructor. Piter, said the male on the other side of him, not bothering to open his eyes. From Gelder's Glen. Come from a family of merchants. Gonna figure out how to use my powers to make a mint at the markets. Piter, Reynald chastised a good-natured grin on his face. King's Blade do not use their powers to influence financial transactions or sell wares. 
Piter scuffed and crossed his arms. The girls next to him giggled in tandem. I'm Emery, the closer of the pair said. And I'm Imery, her sister followed. I'm a year older. We're sisters. And we're from the capital, Emery finished. The pair looked at each other and let out another burst of giggles. Lena wasn't sure what they were laughing about, but they seemed pleasant and harmless. Good, Raynal wandered behind the lectern, his brow furrowing. I had planned to continue our pairing exercises now that we once again have an even number of students, but it seems there has been a change of plans. It's levitation time. Her classmates looked at each other, surprised in each of their expressions. Lena wondered if Torva had anything to do with their new lesson. I would say chances are better than good. She saw Reynal's mouth open and watched him speaking to the class. But his words were far away as fear crept into her mind, drowning them out. Chapter 5 You magical fae, you've probably had life pretty easy before now. Using all your powers to not have to lift a finger. To not have to worry about anything because your magic will take care of everything for you. The grizzled sergeant stared them down, his hands balled into fists that sat on his hips, his expression a scowl that seemed permanent. Well, my magical friends, your last easy day was yesterday. Lena glanced at her classmates to find their expressions vacillating between confusion and fear. They stood assembled on the wide green lawn within the complex of buildings that made up the King's Blade Academy. Stone walls rose on all sides of them, but the blue skies were open above her head, making Lena breathe easier. She'd also managed to get breakfast in the mess hall this morning, which could also have a hand in improving her outlook on the day. Even Sergeant Silix of the Fay Guard couldn't undo the benefits of a large breakfast and a dreamless sleep. I passed out so hard last night I didn't even have the energy left to dream. Reynal had led them in levitation practice for two hours, and Lena hadn't once managed to get her toes to leave the ground. The rest of the class had been comfortably floating a half foot above the floor, while Lena hadn't been able to touch any of the supposed magic that dwelled inside her. After an hour-long break in which recruits were charged with helping out in the kitchens to prep for the evening meal, they'd returned to the classroom for several more hours of magical instruction. By that time, Reynal had been replaced by Torva herself. she decided Lena required a special tutoring session, so, while the rest of the class was sent out for their afternoon turn in the academy gardens, Lena had been goaded for hours into accessing her powers by the simmering redhead, only to face defeat over and over again. Pigeon had attempted to console her in the baths later, but the warm water only served to heighten her exhaustion, and the moment her face hit the pillow, she'd collapsed into unconsciousness. At least Silix isn't asking us to guide the magical stream that lives inside us, she thought wryly, using Reynal's terminology. Mine's not so much a raging torrent as it is a bone-dry riverbed full of dust. Right, Silix said with a clap, drawing her attention back. I'm going to show you the forms, slowly enough at first that even your grandparents could catch them, then speeding up as you learn what they're for. Follow my movements and repeat them. The old sergeant began to move, one arm pushing forward, palm out, followed by the other. He took an exaggerated step forward, his movements in slow motion, arms, legs, hips, torso, all moving as if through water. Lena followed along without effort, but the same wasn't true of, of some of her companions. It wasn't long before Pigeon's face was flushing red. Marcel was huffing and puffing as he tried to balance on one foot. Emery and Imery seemed to be doing fine until Selix began to pick up speed and their feet got entangled during one portion of the routine making them both fall on their behinds. Selix was at their side, critiquing what had gone wrong, when Pigeon let out a groan loud enough for Lena to hear. How are you doing this so easily? she asked Lena, grimacing. It just seems easy, Lena said with a shrug of her shoulders and an awkward grin. This sort of thing isn't one of your normal classes? She was surprised when the other face shook her head. We've never had combat training before, Pigeon mused. Most of us are still considered beginners. It's slow at the beginning for most fey who are starting to discover their magic. It takes time to learn to access it, to control it. She frowned as she wiped the sweat off her brow. 
I much prefer learning to levitate to whatever this is. Time to put your butts in gear, Silex growled. We're going to speed things up and I'm going to come along and show you how to utilize these forms in sparring. He positioned himself in front of Pyta, who, like Lena, had been keeping up with minimal effort. Lena watched as the sergeant swung his hands at Pyta, who blocked it with the beginning move of their sequence. As the sequence continued, she saw that it was really a method of blocking and attacking, as Silix and Pyta seemed to almost dance with each other, raining down light blows back and forth. At the end of the sequence, Silix moved down to stand in front of Lena. They reran the sequence, this time much faster as it quickly became obvious to the sergeant that she could handle it. Their limbs blurred as they ran through the forms, and Silix let out an enthusiastic cry when they reached the end. Now that's more like it! Once they'd all had their one-on-ones with Silix, the old fay paired them off. Run them again against your partner. Run them until you feel comfortable. Lena faced down Pigeon, feeling bad in advance for what she knew was about to happen. She could feel something bubbling up inside her, something fierce, something prompted by her hours spent under Torva's thumb, by feelings of helplessness and frustration, and brought on by the combat training. As hard as it was to hold back, she did it for as long as she could, but there was no way the other fake could keep up with her. That last one was a little hard, Pigeon said, wincing. Then she swung again, only to have her arm quickly batted away by Lena, then receive a kick to her thigh. Ow! Lena was breathing heavily at the restraint, and Silix seemed to sense her problem. We're going to rearrange the pairings now, he said lightly. You, with the curly hair, front and center. Pyta lumbered over to stand before Lena as Silix swapped around the other students. Hi, he said, jerking his head to move his hair out of his eyeline with affected coolness. Lena swallowed a smile and stretched out her muscles, eager for a stronger competitor. Begin, Silix said, and Lena leapt into action, running the forms at lightning speed. It was a struggle for Pyta to catch up, but he did, opting for adding more force to his blows to compensate for her quickness. His cheeks pinkened with embarrassment as Lena ran circles around him, and it caused him to get angry. He swung hard, aiming a kick at her midsection that wasn't exactly part of the sequence they'd been learning. It never connected, however, and a well-timed shove from Lena had him collapsing with a pain shout. Someone's getting creative. Lena turned her head at the familiar voice, finding Bracken leaning against one of the walls, his arms crossed. His expression was impassive, but from the line of his body, she could tell something had angered him. Was it me that set him off? Or what Pyta's blow would have done to me had I let it connect? She couldn't be sure of the answer. Bracken was at her side moments later, motioning toward the student who still lay on the ground. Help the man up at least, he said with exaggerated exasperation. Lena held her hand out to Pyta, but he ignored it, pulling himself to his feet and limping to the side. His pride had been hurt more than his body, she realized, and Lena knew she'd have to do something to remedy the animosity that was brewing. I see they let just about anyone in here, she said archly, figuring she was allowed a little swagger since he was the one who didn't belong in an academy class. No, I'm special, he countered, jerking his head in the old phase direction. Silix used to be my sergeant, and he's always had a soft spot for me. The grizzled sergeant let out a snort of laughter, shaking his head. Enough chit-chat, children. It looks like someone's offering to give a demonstration. Why don't you have a seat on the grass and see how these forms are meant to be used? The students moved to follow Silix's orders, Lena included, but the sergeant's bark stopped her. Where are you going, show-off? Bracken here needs a sparring partner, doesn't he? Lena turned back, her smile widening. The feeling inside her had only grown and the prospect of a partner that wasn't a pushover had her blood pumping. Using her body in this way again was providing her an outlet she sorely needed, a way to work out all the anger and frustration that had been forced down inside her for too long. Right now, she wasn't thinking about Bracken as someone who was her friend. All she saw were the soft parts of his body, the places that would make him crumple. I'm not sure I like that look in your eye. Bracken said as they took up positions facing one another. The others looked on, everyone waiting for Silix to start the show. Begin, he said at last, 
and Lena did not hesitate. She was fast, brutally so, but Brecken was faster. The man was preternaturally quick, as if no milliseconds were lost as his brain told his body what to do. She went through the forms at lightning speed, but Brecken seemed almost bold. Letting out a growl, Lena redoubled her efforts. That's right, get it all out, he said lightly as she pummeled him. All that aggression, aim it right here. His hand froze on his heart for a second, and she instantly pivoted to drive her fist toward the spot. But he batted it away with virtually no effort. Lena abandoned the forms, adapting on the fly, aiming only to hurt Bracken, to wipe the smug smile off his face. She was acting on instinct, ignoring the part of her that told her Bracken was a friend, not a foe. Bracken ducked a split second too late, and a punch landed. His head rocked back on his neck, but he came up smiling. Yes, you're a natural! He caught her when she lunged for his throat and transitioned to redirect her motion, causing her to stumble. Then again, I should have known, considering what you can do with a bow. Lena was back on her feet in a blink. Like a cat, she leapt for him, but a pair of brawny arms caught her and spun her around to land on her feet. All right, that's enough, Silik said casually with a nod, his eyes following her with a weight that had been lacking before. He addressed the seated students, his tone gruff. That's what we're training for. That's what we want to see. You can't always rely on your magic. Sometimes it's going to come down to you and your enemy. Nothing between you but flesh and bone and muscle. You need to be ready. As she was panting, choking down air and trying to calm herself as the rest of the students filed off the field. Pigeon looked back over her shoulder, a concerned expression on her face. Lena sent her a grin, then turned back to Bracken, who looked as if he'd done nothing more strenuous than taking a stroll through a park. He bantered with the old sergeant, and some of the tension in Silks's face melted away. With one final look at Lena, the old fay left through a door in the opposite direction. The moment he was gone, Bracken rounded on her. "'What's gotten into you?' he said, his voice low and urgent. "'For a moment there, I thought you would truly take my head off given half the chance. This isn't still about Roxy, is it?' The other woman's name sent flames racing to her brain, but Lena shook her head, willing herself to calm down. "'No, it's not you. I'm just—' I don't know. I've had enough. You needed to blow off some steam, he said, letting out a long breath. Okay, that makes sense. His head bowed and his voice got even lower. I thought maybe some spell or curse. I haven't been cursed, Lena said evenly. At least, I haven't been cursed again, I should say. If the whole memory loss thing is a curse. She rubbed her eyes, exhaustion suddenly lying heavy on her. I just thought that... After we got to the capital, I'd get to the end of this, her hand waved in front of her, indicating herself. This mystery, but it isn't over. It's just getting started. And when we started sparring, it was like I couldn't contain my feelings anymore. It all came out through my body. Bracken took a step forward and rested his hand on her arm. I understand. I've seen it before. But you're not like those other recruits, he pointed out. So you can't just start tossing them around the practice yard and expect things not to bleed over into those walls. You need friends at the academy, not to make enemies with the realm's strongest magical users. Lena laughed, but there was no humor in it. <laughs> You're right. If you need to kick someone's ass, come find me, he said, his face cracking open into a grin. So you think I could kick your ass, huh? She said, eyebrows waggling. I think you could try, he fired back and they both laughed. Then a cloud passed over the sun, bathing the yard in shadow. A cold wind whistled down the walls and passed over her, and Lena shivered. There's something else, she said without warning. A dream I had. It was as if I was seeing through someone else's eyes. Her eyes. The one who looks like me? Brecken tilted his head, looking at her. What happened in the dream? I was stirring a cauldron, drawing up an image of this village, it seemed like an ordinary place, full of happy fey inhabitants, but there was an air of menace seeing it through the bubbling liquid. Lena remembered how it had felt, watching the forest seem to engulf the village until it was a speck in the sea of green. She tried to relate it to him, tried to express how she'd felt danger was lurking all around the small woodland village. When she saw his face grow pale, Lena's stomach dropped. Something's happened, something bad. 
There is a village north of here, one of the older ones that has gotten lax about pruning back the verge at their borders. I heard about it from a returning soldier. He said the last time he was in the area, the road to the village dead-ended into forest about a mile out. He could not risk getting through. What happened to the village? she asked in a hushed tone. He doesn't know for certain, but the rumors in that area are that the wild swallowed it whole. No one has seen anyone from the village for weeks. But the dream was only the night before last, she said, frowning. It can't be the same village. It doesn't make sense. Nothing seemed to nowadays. Still a chill ran through Lena. She knew the dream was more than just her imagination at play. She was connected to the fae who wore Lena's face as her own, and that fae was connected to the wilds. I'm connected to the wilds, whether I want it or not. It was an uneasy truth, but one she could no longer deny. Chapter 6 You're stubborn, Torbus circled the small desk where Lena sat, hands spread on the surface, breath trapped in her chest. I like stubborn. Of course she does. They'd already been at it for two hours today, Torva attempting to make her connect to her powers and perform a menial task. Making the pen in front of her write a word on the smooth surface of the desk, so far the pen had not moved an inch. Lena had been at the academy for two weeks now, but the long hours spent in the sapphire room had resulted in no effect. Not with Reynal, not with Torva herself, nor any of the other instructors who had tried their hands. She knew Torva might consider herself a patient woman, but that patience had long worn thin. Why doesn't she just sick the eye on me? Lena had wondered the same for days now. The creature could remove Lena's block, then tell Torva whatever details he discovered once it was gone. But she'd yet to see the hellspawn again after their first meeting, which was both a relief and a source of tension. Torva stopped circling and bent over the desk in front of her, her hands clutching its wooden surface so tightly that Lena was surprised she didn't crush the wood in her fists. If asking politely isn't going to work, which I'm beginning to suspect is the case, then I'm going to have to try another tactic. Asking politely? I'm beginning to think the leader of the King's Blade is completely insane. The woman's ice-blue eyes bored into her. Philosophers the web over have wrestled with an essential question for ages. Is it better to be feared or loved? Torva straightened, looking down her hawkish nose at Lena. Since there is no love lost between us, I think we're going to have to give fear a try. The lights in the room vanished. Lena blinked into the darkness, her body tensing and drawing in on herself. She held up her hand in front of her, but there was nothing there only the thick black and the sound of her own breath. No lights, a voice whispered around her, echoing as if she were in a cave deep underground. At the thought of the cave, she heard the splash of moisture, felt the coolness radiating from the cave walls. The closeness, the knowledge that she'd never find her way out of the underground maze, throttled her. Her throat closed and she struggled to breathe as panic waylaid her. I don't like this. The ancient fear of the dark crawled into her insides, making her shake. Now, draw on your magic. Make a ball of light float above you, driving out the darkness. The whisper was back, presenting the solution to her problems. She ignored the ball of light prompt, instead calling on the innate power of every fae to illuminate herself. She could use the glow of her skin to light the cave, except now she couldn't. She tried again and again, but could not access that power either, one she'd used countless times with no effort. A ball of light floating above you, the voice repeated, and this time the command was clear. Lena realized that whatever Torva was doing, she'd blocked off access to her simple magic. Annoyed, she closed her eyes and tried to drive out the fear, focusing on visualizing a ball of light and projecting it outside herself. Nothing happened. I don't think a ball of light is forthcoming, she called out finally, even fear starting to wane after so long. Lights returned and Lena found herself sitting as she had been, at the small wooden desk. She looked up at Torva, who resumed her angry pacing. 
There are worse things than the dark, the woman grumbled, and whether her words were directed at her or herself, Lena wasn't certain. We are only getting started. I will break this block inside you, if I have to parade each and every one of your worst fears before you to do so. You're not going to win. Lena's shoulders slumped, and she wanted to put her head down and surrender. Torvald moved her arms, and the world around her blanked to white. She knew they were on to another frightening scenario and praised herself for the fight to come. Lena didn't bother rejoining her class with the rest of her cohort after Torva finally released her. It was the doldrums of the afternoon, and she had no desire to sit in a circle and watch the others effortlessly wield their power, especially after the gauntlet of horror Torva had just put her through. Instead, she snuck through the halls, avoiding any black-clad fae while returning to a location they'd passed on her tour. The Academy Library was bound to be a font of free-flowing information, something she'd yet to have in the short time since she'd woken up without her memories. Once inside, she spent a few minutes getting her bearings and avoiding the librarian who moved between the rows, reshelving books and scrolls. She had only one place to start, the tiny fragment of information she had about herself that wasn't even a positive fact, but a negative statement. I am not Lynetta Chimera, but I have her money pouch and her ring. Maybe it's time to find out who she really is. It took some time, but she finally located the section housing books about the Fey nobility. Pulling out an oversized home, she blew the dust off the cover, then held back a cough as it flew up into her face. Lena carried it back to a table and opened it searching until she came to the Chimera clan. She scanned it until she came across a portrait of a very beautiful woman with sad eyes. She was dressed in finery, her hair carefully coiffed, everything about her image broadcasting the best of the Fey noble class. Except the eyes. This woman knows pain. She knows loss. Lena read the section that followed the portrait. Lady Lynetta Chimera, daughter of Lord Ben Chimera, and his wife, Salandra Spara is heir to the Chimera name and ancestral lands. She has known the realm around for her ethereal beauty, legendary poise, and generous heart. Lady Lynetta had made a successful match with Lord Harold Grandel, see Grandel clan. But Lord Harold's accidental death took him too young, before the couple could produce offspring. Lena frowned, having learned what was behind the sadness in the woman's eyes. She noticed a symbol at the end of the line, drawing her eye to the bottom of the page and a small footnote scribbled in different handwriting. Lady Lynetta Camara was rumored to have an adopted daughter, a child not of her own blood. Although the girl has seldom been seen and never introduced at court, which leaves the rumor unconfirmed by satisfied sources. An adopted daughter? The words jolted her. Could it be? It would make sense of why she'd been dressed in fancy clothing and carrying a full money pouch belonging to the noblewoman, and wearing her ring. She stared down at the ring. Once again, she was filled with more questions. I've got to get out of here. Got to find a way out of the academy and ask questions from people who know the answers. She was still thinking about how to manage that while in the mess hall that evening. A plate of food sat ignored in front of her, as she sat at one of the long tables, surrounded by other recruits and Kingsblade members. "'You should eat that, you know,' Pigeon said, pointing to her plate before taking a bite of her own food. "'Training takes a lot out of a body,' she said around a mouthful. Lena dragged the plate back in front of her, knowing the other fay was right. "'You weren't in class this afternoon when they announced it,' Pigeon continued, pausing for a sip of water. "'But they confirmed our positions for the upcoming King's Day celebrations.' King's Day? Lena asked, spearing a potato and lifting it to her lips. Yes, King's Day, Pigeon said matter-of-factly. It's only the biggest day in the capital. Everyone in the whole city comes out to celebrate King Lyre. There will be a teeming King's Day market, revelries on every street corner, and even an elaborate outdoor ball that night. The king always attends the ball, you know. He does, Lena said, mostly to indicate she was listening. She'd heard of King's Day before, but hadn't put much thought into the actual celebrations. Too bad I don't have any fine dresses to wear. Can't wear dresses, Pigeon said before swallowing her mouthful. 
We've got to wear our King's Blade cadet robes. Still, we have a special place near the King during dinner that night, and King Lyre always walks along the line of cadets and inspects them. According to Marksell, last year he got close enough to one of us that his hair brushed the cadet's shoulder. Could you imagine? Pigeon folded her hands together at chest level and let out a long sigh. He's so dreamy. Lena blinked, charmed by the longing in the farm girl's expression. Is everyone invited to the ball? Not hardly. Only nobility and king's blade and some upper echelons of the Fay military. You know, the creme de la creme. Pigeon's mouth dropped open, and Lena thought for a moment she could see a line of drool coming from her mouth. I too love creme. This time Lena couldn't hold in her laughter. It must be some dinner. It is, Pigeon said, her face going serious. We're talking seven courses and dessert. And what desserts they have? She blinked, her cheeks turning pink. At least that's what I've heard. This will be my first time attending the festivities in the city. Back on the farm, we usually roast a chicken and have a bonfire out back. Father was a whiz with fires. He used to be able to produce them in any color. The plump woman's face took on a faraway cast. That must be where I got my powers from. He always was a little stronger than everyone else in the area, and I'm stronger still. Pigeon blinked out of her reverie and popped a biscuit into her mouth. If only Father could come to the capital for the party, he'd love it. I'm sure he would. Lena tuned out Pigeon's reply as the Fay continued to ramble on about a celebration she hadn't yet seen herself. Lena, however, was focused on the opportunity the festivities presented. There is probably no better chance to do some digging into Lanetta Camara than the King's Day revelries. It's my best chance to find out where she is and whether the rumors about her adopted daughter are true. She found her appetite returning in shocking form, quickly cleaning her plate and even reaching over to snag one of the extra biscuits Pigeon always managed to sweet talk out of the servers. Hi, the fay cried, then laughed. You probably need it more than me. I do, Lena said, nodding. I really do. Chapter 7 Look at those scarves, Pigeon let out a squeal and set off down the narrow row between stalls. Lena followed, worried that if she lost sight of the other woman for even a moment, she'd be pulled away into the crush of bodies, never to be found again. They were in the marketplace that had been erected in the central square of Exaria. Normally a public green space, the grass was now awash in tents, tables, and the bodies of festival-goers who were flitting excitedly between them like hummingbirds from flower to flower. She found Pigeon speaking with a cheerful woman with an apple-cheeked child riding on her hip. The infant fay gurgled and reached for the scarves that were hanging from the tent above it. Lena smiled at the baby, wanting to rub its ears, as it was said to bring good luck. Instead, she watched as Pigeon fretted over the ornately dyed silk scarf in her hand. It really is beautiful, she said with a wishful sigh, running her fingers over the green fabric, but very dear. Lena snatched up the tag that was affixed to the scarf, then pulled out her coin purse. Although she'd managed to run through about half of its contents on her journey to Exaria, there was still more than enough inside to afford a few fair trinkets. Here, she said, passing two gold pieces to the vendor and picking up a similar scarf in blue. She then reached over to lightly rub the left ear tips of the child, cooing down at her. The child's mother thanked them profusely as they moved past the stall. Lena wound the scarf around her neck and motioned for Pigeon to do the same. We're not technically allowed ornamentation, only our cadet uniform, she said, then giggled. <laughs> but it's King's Day, so let's risk it. She arranged the green scarf around her own neck, then hugged Alina tightly. I've never had anything as nice. It was very kind of you to buy this for me. It's been kind of you to take me under your wing, she replied, appreciation clear in her voice. I've felt a bit lost since arriving to the capital, and you've helped me adjust. It's the least I could do. Pigeon hugged her again, and Lena let out a laugh. They'd become closer the longer she was at the academy. Pigeon was usually the sole bright spot in her day, besides her fleeting glimpses of Bracken when they passed in the courtyard or the corridors. The rest of her time was spent under Torva's thumb. 
being subjected to whatever trials the King's Blade leader thought would remove Lena's block. Nothing had worked, but that didn't mean Lena hadn't stumbled out of each session exhausted and shaking after facing off against that determined redhead. She shivered now at the memory of yesterday's torment, hours spent kneeling on grains of uncooked rice, books balanced on outstretched hands. Torva had turned up the heat, literally, by igniting a ring of fire around her that would flame higher if she shifted or tried to put down the weight. I smell something delicious, Pigeon called, bringing Lena's mind back to the present. Her braids whipped around as she grabbed Lena's hand and dragged her forward, toward a large grill where meat on sticks cooked over the coals. There were several grain-robed cadets near, pouring sauce over their sticks and murmuring with appreciation around bites. Pigeon insisted on purchasing Lena's portion and carried them over to the group. Imery and Emery were among them. The girl's signature mom stopped giggling was more subdued today, Lena noticed. She wasn't the only one. Pigeon moaned in delight as she took a bite of the meat, asking the girls if this wasn't the best King's Day they'd ever been to. Not quite, Imery replied, the corners of her mouth turning down. There are less people gathered here than other years. Fewer vendors, Emery agreed. And there are half as many wandering minstrels as last year. I did notice a troop of jugglers and mimes from off-world, Imery said, tossing her empty stick into a nearby receptacle and licking her lips to clear them of any lingering sauce droplets. It's not often we get off-world performers here, since it's usually our musicians and dancers who are sought after in other realms. Well, this celebration beats the pants off the one we have back home. It's two miles to the nearest village, and that village only boasts about a hundred people or so, but the village green is always decorated to the hilt with flowers and ribbons. Everyone brings something to sell or to share, I spend the whole week before baking apple hand pies, and Father lets me keep a quarter of the profits. He usually roasts the bird to contribute to the feast that evening, and everyone in the village says his birds are always the plumpest and juiciest. Imery and Emery watched Pigeon prattle on about her rural village with twin expressions of amazement and amusement. It was evident to Lena that they were accustomed to celebrating in the capital, on a scale which was impossible to match. Didn't you say you wanted to look for a new pair of boots? Lena interrupted gently, refocusing her friend's attention. I have been saving up for a pair. All that hand pie money adds up. Lena waved at the sisters as Pigeon wandered away from the grill, then started after her. They weaved through stalls looking for boots, stopping now and again when something took her companion's fancy. Lena's heart wasn't in the shopping especially since her wardrobe for the foreseeable future was the same grey robes she was wearing now. The marketplace did represent an opportunity she was denied in the academy, however. Outside the high stone walls of the academy, she was free to hunt up information. Lynetta Camara was still her main target, since she'd somehow managed to end up with the woman's money pouch and possibly her noble ring as well. She glanced down at the crown tipped in jeweled points and frowned, wondering if she'd been given the ring as a member of a noble family, or whether Lynetta's ring had made it onto her own finger somehow. She didn't like to think about the second possibility. Lord Malvo, the pretend noble who had insisted on escorting her back to Exeria, only to imprison her, had accused her and Bracken of murdering Lynetta to take her place. Lena didn't think herself capable of such deviousness, nor could she imagine brazenly executing a noble and expecting to assume her position in society. But her lack of any memories beyond a moon cycle or so meant she couldn't be sure of anything, even herself. Who do you trust when you can't trust yourself? Excuse me, she said to one of the vendors in the stall across from the one where Pigeon was pursuing glass beads. The teenage fay looked up with a bored expression, brushing his shaggy hair out of his eyes. Do you happen to know where I can find Lynetta Chimera? I was hoping to pay a visit to an old friend while I'm in the capital. The young man looked her over, his eyebrow quirking at the grey robes she was wearing. Lena gritted her teeth, wanting to kick herself for her lame story. Of course he'd be able to see I was in the academy. I'm wearing their blasted uniform, after all. I'm an idiot. 
I've heard of the chimeras, he said blandly. But we ain't exactly rubbing elbows with that sort if you catch my drift. Lena nodded, thanking him, then scurrying away, feeling like a fool. She wasn't deterred, however, taking an opportunity when Pigeon was distracted to ask for information about the noble woman. Despite several questions to several different vendors, no one seemed to know Lynetta's exact whereabouts. Most nobles live up in the heights, close to the palace, but you must know that already, an older fay woman with platinum blonde hair in a set of elaborate buns informed her after gesturing to her ring. Now can I interest you in a pair of gloves? These here would match well with your lovely scarf, milady. She thanked the woman, then turned around, only to freeze when she saw a familiar figure headed in her direction. Without thinking, Lena took off at a sprint, hustling through the people around her and attempting to stay out of sight. She heard a shout from behind her and put on a burst of speed, her heart beating frantically. Lena skidded around a corner only to stop dead as a crowd of onlookers applauded a juggler, who was tossing flaming pins into the air and catching them with ease. She looked for a way around the crowd, but before she could rush off, someone grabbed the collar of her robe, holding her fast. "'I've been looking for you for weeks,' a gravelly voice said. She looked up into the light brown eyes of Lord Malvo Cavaggio. He held her fast, his grin like a shark's. "'Imagine finding you here!' "'Let me go!' she hissed, feeling anger starting to well up inside her. The nobleman had almost a foot of height on her and broad shoulders. But she remembered how he'd avoided conflict when their group had run into a pack of bandits that had turned out to be werewolves. "'Maybe I can take him,' she thought, stealing herself for a fight. "'Oh, no, you don't,' he said, chiding her, while flicking open his cloak to reveal a sword strapped to his belt. "'Try anything and I'll run you through!' You couldn't. You'd be arrested in moments, especially with all these witnesses, and your fake ring won't keep you from punishment when they realize you've murdered a King's Blade cadet in cold blood. Malvo laughed. I don't know how you tricked your way into those robes, but you don't fool me. He gave her another shake. They'll probably give me a medal for getting rid of an imposter. What do you want from me? She growled out of patience. Just another person who wants to push me around thinking I'm helpless. When am I going to prove that I'm not? Her gaze flicked to his sword again, doing the math. He clicked his tongue at her. You still owe me for the chaos you caused. Before I thought I could reform you, you mean you thought you could control me, she cut in, her hands balling up into fists. In any event, that offer no longer stands. Now I just want revenge. He put his hand on the hilt of his sword, an evil look in his eyes. Fear rose in her, warring with the anger. She was about to attack and take her chances against his sword, but before she could, a plume of smoke rose from directly behind Malvo's head. The smoke darkened and suddenly little flames licked at the cloak, fastened around his shoulders, giving him what looked like a fiery orange halo. Malvo froze, sniffing twice before his eyes widened in recognition. He let out a yelp and struggled to remove his cloak, the flames spreading quickly. The moment he released her, Lena backed away, quickly, bumping into Pigeon, who was standing a few paces away. The Pigeon grabbed her arm and pulled her back the way they'd come, hurrying away from the flaming imposter. "'Who was that?' Pigeon asked, looking over her shoulder as they sprinted toward the border of the square. "'No one you'd like to know,' Lena replied, then pointed to a tea house across the road. "'Let's duck in there and catch our breath.' They slid onto stools and waited for service. Pigeon held up her hands, her eyes wide. Look, I'm shaking. I've never used my magic offensively before. It was a thrill, but also scary. Lena understood then that it was her friend who'd been responsible for lighting up Malvo's cloak. I'm glad you did. That man is no good. Pigeon nodded. He threatened you? I heard him. But who is he? He goes by the name Lord Malvo Cavaggio, Lena said, feeling that she owed Pigeon an explanation. Besides, she was tired of keeping everything to herself. It had felt good to tell her story to Bracken, and it had surprisingly brought them closer together. There's no way Pigeon is going to betray me. And he's an imposter. Chapter 8 
Their tea had gone cold by the time Lena finished her story. Pigeon had sat through the recitation with eyes wide, letting out the occasional gasp or sigh at the appropriate parts. So you're not a noble, and neither is Malvo. Malvo most definitely is not. He admitted as much to me, whether or not I am... She trailed off, shrugging her shoulders. I don't know, and I won't know until my memories come back or I find someone who knows me. And that someone is Lynetta Camara. I can't say for sure, but since I have her money pouch and this ring, there's a chance she might. Unfortunately, that's all I have to go on. Pigeon reached across the table and patted her hand. Poor dear, I can't imagine not knowing who I was or where I came from. Father says my brain is like gnomish cheese, just full of holes, but I've never forgotten my name. Lena frowned and Pigeon smacked her forehead. I didn't mean that you did it on purpose. I'm sorry, my mouth gets away from me sometimes. It's okay, Lena said. Besides, I don't know if I did it on purpose or not. What if I took a potion or cast a spell on myself or something? Why would you do that? Pigeon looked genuinely confused. I don't like to think of the reasons why. Like treason, treachery, or trouble of some other kind. But if I did this to myself, I still want to know that for certain. I have this feeling, she said, looking out the windows to make sure Malvo hadn't tracked them down. This feeling that something terrible is going to happen. If I can find out who I am, maybe I can, I don't know, if not prevent it, maybe lessen the blow? She put her head down on her folded arms, feeling defeated. It wasn't easy to live with unending uncertainty. Hey, Pigeon called gently, her mile-a-minute conversational pace slowing. With a voice laden with compassion, she covered Lena's hand with her own. I can't imagine how difficult this has been for you, but look on the bright side. There's a bright side? Lena asked, lifting her head to look at her companion. Pigeon nodded. Now you don't have to go it alone. What say we go track down Lynetta Camara and figure out what she knows? Lena perked up. Really? You want to help? She was grateful, but also a little worried. If it turned out that Lena wasn't as innocent as she felt, she didn't want to risk dragging Pigeon down with her. I've already helped, her friend pointed out, and I can do more than simple fire magic. You need someone to watch your back if that Malvo character comes after you again. Plus, I'm super charming. People can't help but tell me all their secrets. Lena laughed. <laughs> you can say that again. I just spilled everything to you. She stood, setting a couple of coppers on the table. Let's go before I lose my nerve and tell you it's safer if you have nothing to do with me. You can't scare me off that easily. You should see this mean old sow we have on this farm. She's a big bully, but I don't take any guff off that swine. Pigeon's words had Lena cracking a smile. They walked out of the tea house, and the smile faded as Lena scanned the area around them. There was no sign of Malvo, but a contingent of Kingsblades stood on the road outside the square. Academy cadets were supposed to stay together in small groups. They were allowed to visit the markets today and take part in the festivities on the square but Lena doubted they were supposed to go into the city proper. Pigeon followed her gaze, then took her hand. She jerked her head in the direction of the alley next to the shop and led her that way, scurrying quickly to avoid being seen. I might be wider than the average Faye, but I'm no less stealthy, she said when they were out of sight. Lena just shook her head, amazed to discover that sweet little Pigeon had a devious streak. They walked for a while, away from the central square and into the city streets. The farther they walked, the thinner the crowds became. Someone told me the nobles live in the heights, near the palace, she told her companion. I've heard that too, although I've never been there. Heights to me sounds like there are steps involved, and I've never been excited about climbing stairs. Lena laughed, glad to have Pigeon around to keep her spirits up. Let's hope it's a very easy incline. They were passing three girls who had baskets filled with fruit in their hands. Excuse me, ladies. Could you point us in the direction of the heights? That way, said the oldest one, jerking her chin to the right. Go up three streets, then turn left. You'll be able to see them soon after. 
They followed her directions, and within ten minutes of walking, they saw their first set of stone steps. They weaved up a hill that was studded with rose bushes and seemed to come out on a street above where a row of larger-than-average houses stood. "'I think that's our destination,' Lena said, holding back a grin at Pigeon's groan of despair. She slowed her pace as they mounted the stairs. The scent of roses in bloom wafted around them, making the climb more pleasant, although her companion didn't seem to think so. Finally, they reached the top and came out on a level street. Lena turned to look back down to where they'd started and realized she could see all the way to the square and the bustling market. Pigeon stood huffing, trying to catch her breath. She waved down a boy who was smeared with soot. He was carrying a long-handled bristle brush. "'Can you point the way to the Chimera House?' she wheezed at him. The chimney sweep took a look at her red face and frowned. "'Who's asking?' "'A King's Blade Cadet,' Pigeon said, attempting an imperious look, but it was clear the boy was not impressed. "'Here,' Lena said, holding out two coppers. "'For your trouble.' The boy eyed her. "'Make it a silver and I'll tell you.' Pigeon grumbled while Lena dug the coin out of her purse. She flicked it at the boy, who caught it. He tossed his thumb over his shoulder. "'Go round the corner and up the stairs. It's on the closest street to the palace.' He took off at a swift pace, leaving Pigeon to rattle off a number of near curses. "'His ears were barely pointed,' she groused. "'You know that's a sign of underhandedness.' The second set of stairs was steeper and longer, going up several streets and cutting a jagged path between houses and shops. Up and up they climbed until the stairs ended on a street of shiny marble edifices. Lena let out a slow whistle. Who in the realm needs this much space? Are noble families especially large? Pigeon shook her head, then tumbled over, breathing heavily. Not especially, she managed to croak. Lena looked around her at the large houses with one eight gates and mouldings. She could see a fountain in the distance in the center of a cobblestone square. When she turned to look in the other direction, she saw a pair of golden gates that were taller than the houses around her. That must be the palace, Pigeon said, straightening, which means the Chimera house has to be on this street. Lena looked in both directions, then caught sight of an elder fay washerwoman carrying a bundle of laundry. Pardon me, she said, approaching the woman with a friendly tone. Do you happen to know the direction of the Chimera house? We've gotten a little turned around up here, and I can't remember if it's right or left. Right. Last house before the palace gates. You'll know which one I mean when you see it. She gave them a nod and continued on her way. Lena started in that direction and Pigeon trudged after her, grumbling about needing more than one stick of meat to make the return journey. They hadn't walked far when Lena froze, then pulled Pigeon across the street and around the corner of the wall surrounding one of the houses. That must be the Chimera house, she said, pointing back across the way. The house had four stories and stretched the length of the block. The wall looked like it had been comprised of river stones ages ago, giving it a smooth but variable texture. Given the size of the stones, Lena figured it must have taken several people weeks to complete. It was the only one like it on the street. The gates were made of platinum, and an intricate sea was worked into either side. They must be nearly as rich as the king himself, Pigeon said. Maybe richer, she bit her lip, looking back at Lena. So, how are we going to do this? Well, I thought maybe we could knock on the door, but given that there is a rather large gate in the way, I'm not certain. She sized up the challenge. I suppose I could climb the fence, but... But houses like that have guards. Lena turned at the familiar voice, her insides lighting up. She tried to keep a hold of her excitement to see Bracken schooling her features. But houses like that have guards, she parroted, even though that wasn't what she was going to say. What are you doing here? Like you, I was given a free day after completing my duties early. I came looking for you, figuring you'd be on the square with the rest of the cadets. How foolish of me to think you'd be where you're supposed to be. His voice was like gravel, his face stony. 
angry again, she thought, suppressing a sigh. You know I couldn't let this opportunity pass. Who knows the next time I'll be let out again? Probably never once they catch you for this infraction. Pigeon jumped at the Velix's words. You don't think that, do you? Nerves were getting the better of her, now that Bracken was on the scene. His uniform was crisp and clean, his demeanor commanding, and the farm girl considered him an authority, likely because she'd seen his performance during their combat drills with Silix. It's okay, Lena told her friend. We just won't get caught. Remember, you can be as stealthy as anyone. Her words seemed to do the trick. Pigeon got a hold of herself, sniffing a few times and straightening her robes. Right, we won't get caught. I found you pretty easily, Bracken pointed out. You talked to plenty of people at the market, and on your way here, it wasn't hard to find out where you were headed. What I don't understand is why you're here. Lena stared up at him, her expression earnest. I have to know, once and for all. I have to find out who this Lynetta Camara is to me, and what I am to her. You can't just break into the Camara house, he said in a steely tone. That would be insane. We don't have to break in, Pigeon said reasonably. We can simply walk up and say we're there to speak to the Lady Lynetta. We aren't exactly vagabonds. We're King's Blade cadets. That carries some weight, doesn't it? Not with the highest echelon of nobility. Very little impresses them. Besides, she's not there. How do you know? Lena asked, although if he had said it, she knew it must be true. Because I've been asking after her, discreetly of course. Since we got to Exeria, the Lady Lynetta hasn't been seen in weeks. There are rumors floating all around town as to her whereabouts. She left over a month ago, headed south, and hasn't been seen since. I've heard that her father has spoken to high-ranking officers about tracking her down. Missing, Lena mused, then his words fully impacted on her. Why didn't you mention this sooner? She was filled with warmth at the realization that he'd been looking after her even while they were separated. Because I know about your propensity to go off half-cocked, like you are right now. I'm willing to help, but you've got to let me handle things in my own time. Dealing with nobility takes delicacy, not just storming up to the gate and demanding access. He had a point, even if she didn't like to admit it. I can wait, but not forever. She gave the Chimera Mansion another look, then turned her back on it. Now, let's discuss how we're going to make our way back to the square without getting caught. Chapter 9 The main square of the capital city of the Fey Realm went through a substantial transition between day and night. While it had been a teeming market for most of the day, once the afternoon heat settled in, the vendors broke down their stalls and carted away their merchandise. Then members of the Royal Guard brought out long tables and benches that stretched the length of the grassy square, save for a section of grass that Lena learned was reserved as a dance floor of sorts. At one end, a wide stage was erected, and tables were positioned there as well. At the back of the stage was another step up, this one about a foot taller than the rest of the stage. A single table sat there with five chairs on either side of a larger seat wrought of gold and lined with gems. The space was a flurry of activity, and King's Blade cadets were supposed to lend a hand where needed. Pigeon and Lena were busy setting out plates and silverware for the massive banquet that was to take place that evening. Everyone in Exaria was invited to the festivities, and already the smells of a feast in the making were making Lena and Pigeon drool. I hope they have ham, the plump fay murmured as she tried to set her plates out as quickly as possible. With one eye on the banquet staging area that had been assembled along one of the streets bordering the green space, Pigeon wasn't paying much attention to the task at hand, leaving Lena to straighten the plates as she laid a fork and spoon on top of each one. As the sun began to set, lights appeared in the square. One moment there was only the red rays of the setting sun, and the next small white floating balls of light blazed to life. The lights were a signal, apparently because crowds started to flood into the streets, approaching the square and waiting for permission to enter. Come on, 
Pigeon said, pointing toward the stage. King's Blade always get pride of place. Let's find a spot at one of the good tables while we still can. They were settled in by the time the crowd started streaming in, surrounded by other cadets in matching grey robes. King's Blade in black dominated the rest of the tables close to the stage. The tables on the stage were much slower to fill, as well-dressed Fay walked sedately toward their accommodation, not forced to jockey for position like the rest. It didn't take long for Lena to realize those tables were reserved for the Fay nobility. Lena was impressed by the scale of the celebrations. She stood on her bench to see over the sea of people. Almost every table was stuffed with bodies, and there were many excited murmurs about the food and festivities. Her own cohort had located them and joined them at their table, talking among themselves about their finds at the market. Lena climbed back down, retaking her seat, and wondering aloud where Bracken might be sitting. The soldiers are seated at nearby tables just below ours, Pigeon said, pointing to where light blue uniforms dominated the area. Maybe he's over there, she fiddled with her fork and spoon, giving Lena a look. Your friend is very handsome, Lena rolled her eyes. He's also a pain in my backside. Pigeon laughed. That means you definitely like him. She ignored her friend's words, turning her attention to the stage, which was now full of nobles. I bet Lynette Camara has friends up there, she mused. I wonder if anyone knows me. She hadn't thought about being recognized herself except by Malvo, since no one in the academy seemed to know her. But now that she was in the world at large, there was a chance that someone would know who she was. There was a sudden blast of fanfare, and the floating lights above her started to flash different colors in time. Red, green, blue, and yellow blinked in succession, and the invisible music swelled. Suddenly, a fey male appeared on the stage in the gold jewel-encrusted throne. A deafening cheer went up from all assembled, and Lena's eyes widened as she got her first glance of the fey king. He was tall, his bearing beyond regal. His features were so attractive that he seemed almost unreal, as if he were painted in oils and not a living, breathing man. White blonde hair graced his noble head, and eyes the deep blue of the sea that surrounded the realm stared out at his subjects with an intensity that made her heart beat harder. He's beautiful, she murmured, and Pigeon nodded her head. King Lyre lifted his hands, and the music stopped. He spoke his voice, carrying over the entire square, although it sounded as if he was sitting beside her. My fellow Fay, it is my honor to host you this evening, in the hopes that our fellowship will renew and revive us. Thank you all for coming to my name day celebration. Another roar from the crowd followed his words. When it had settled, he spoke again. I'm a man of few words, but a powerful appetite. Enjoy the feast and the dancing to follow. A short burst of fanfare followed, accenting the end of his speech. Then servers bustled around, placing heaping plates on tables. Others carried bottles of sweet wine and filled glasses. Lena was salivating openly as her table was filled with food and drink. She fell to eating with a gusto that even Pigeon couldn't match. Although it hadn't lifted, the weight of worry she carried had eased. It's because I have another friend to help me carry it, she thought glancing at her companion. She'd never seen the other fae so happy. Her round cheeks were pink, and her eyes sparkled, reflecting the lights that floated above them. The king is taller than I pictured, Marcel said, round bites of roasted vegetables. And so stately, Pigeon agreed, not to mention easy on the eyes. Father would say he's the prize winner half out of the bunch. Emery and I returned to look at each other, and dissolved into giggles. Piter fixed Pigeon with a grin. Your father must be a very interesting person. Oh, he is, she agreed. He considers himself to be a keen observer of the fey condition, as he calls it. Lena hid a smile behind a bite of leafy lettuce, tossed in a mixture of vinegar and honey. She wondered what the fey he was busy observing thought of Pigeon's father. I bet they have a very different outlook on things than he does. She glanced at the stage again, focusing on where the king sat, flanked by nobles who spoke casually with him. 
Lena wondered what it would be like to sit at the king's side, making conversation. It wasn't something she was sure she'd enjoy, especially since she knew she was under suspicion. If King Lara speaks to me, it will likely be during an interrogation, my own. I think Lena has a crush on our king, Imery said, making her sister dissolve in laughter. Marcel leaned in to put an arm around her. You know, my sister has a bit of a crush on King Lyra also. She's ten and a half, but too precocious by half, if you ask my mother. She has several prints of the king on the walls of her bedroom, and even a doll version of him. You hear that, Lena? Peter said from across the table, waggling his eyebrows at her while peeling an apple. You can get a king doll of your very own. Lena waved her hand dismissively. I don't have a crush on him. I've just never seen him before. In person, I mean. She covered quickly. Imri and Imri had twin expressions of surprise. You're a noble, right? She said, pointing to her ring. It seems strange that you've not been brought to meet the king. I thought all nobles were given a personal introduction. I'm going to walk a bit, she said, changing the subject. I always walk off a rich meal, and this one has been positively decadent. She rose, giving Pigeon a slight nod when she noticed her friend's eyes following. I'll be back. Turning away from the table, she walked at a sedate pace, weaving her way closer to the stage. She scanned the crowd, not certain what she was looking for. Maybe I don't need to use my eyes. Maybe my ears will serve me better. She focused eavesdropping on conversations as she went, hoping to overhear someone talking about Lynetta. Changes were not good, and the odds were stacked against her, but she was desperate not to waste this opportunity. Conversations flowed freely around her, but most were focused on the festivities and the king. Lena made a jagged advance toward the stage, not wanting to catch the eye of any of the royal guard who were making slow patrols through the tables. There was a hubbub at one of the tables, and she caught sight of the back of a man with chestnut hair. She felt an icy splash of fear before she realized it wasn't Malvo. That was close, she told herself, keeping her eyes peeled for any sight of the man. She was among the tables closest to the stage where minor nobles were gathered. The tone of conversation shifted, and she heard several complaints about placement. Some thought they should have been on the stage itself, while others grumped about their portion sizes and the quality of the food. Lena hated the entitlement in their voices and tuned them out as she came close to the stairs that led up to the stage. Do I dare go up there? She did have a ring that marked her as nobility, but she knew that wasn't enough. The guards positioned on the stage were alert but jovial, and Lena thought she might have a chance to smile her way past them. She turned in a leisurely circle, making sure no one was coming up behind her, then started for the stairs but froze when a large man came barreling down them directly toward her. Lena moved to the side, assuming the noble was filled with self-importance and would assume she would make her way for him. But when she shifted, he turned course to intercept her. You, he said, pointing at her when his feet hit the grass. You would show up here of all places. I'm sorry? she said, taking several steps backward. I think you must have mistaken me for someone else. I know it's you. No need to lie, girl. His all-white hair marked him as old, likely hundreds of years or more, but he had the energy of a young man. His face was red, his motions jerky as he reached for her. Lena danced back, not wanting the stranger to get a hold of her. He scowled at her, leaning in to fix her with a glare. I knew since the day you turned up out of the forest that you were nothing but trouble. Where's Lynetta? Her eyes widened. Lynetta, she asked, more out of shock than anything. Caught off guard. Don't play dumb, child. What have you done with her? I... Lena didn't know how to respond. How does this man know me? Although she was filled with confusion, she was relieved at one aspect. She'd confirmed that Lynetta and she were connected. You won't fob me off with idiotic stares and half-baked stories. Tell me where she is. The older fay lunged at her, 
this time grabbing hold of her arms. She was about to struggle when a sudden gust of wind blew through the square. The lights that had floated above them blinked out, plunging them into darkness. There were many gasps and some screams as the night's darkness swallowed them. The stranger released her, and Lena took a step back, then froze as the wind hit her. It felt like cold fingers were squeezing her heart, making her gasp and clutch her chest. Then it was gone, the feeling vanishing as the wind disappeared. The lights flashed to life, and Lena's gaze turned to the stage where Lyre was making shapes with his hands. She realized then that the king himself had created the floating spheres of light with his magic. Lena knew someone powerful must have put out the lights, powerful enough to dislodge the Fey King's own magic. A throaty laugh echoed in her head so loudly at that moment she had to close her eyes. She put her hands on her head to stop the sound, but it grew and grew until she had to grit her teeth against the pain. Then, like the wind, it was gone. Lena opened her eyes, and there, impressed in the grass in front of her, was the image of a grinning, tooth-filled mouth. Chapter 10 She blinked, and the image was gone. The grass beneath her feet was the same as it had been a moment ago, just as green and verdant as any in the realm. Lena was shaky, feeling a sudden need to sit down. What just happened to me? Unable to help herself, she glanced in the direction of the king. His blue eyes were focused solely on her, and she could feel the weight of his gaze. Stumbling, she careened away from the stairs back in the direction of her table. She'd made it less than a dozen paces before Torva stepped into her path, blocking her. You're with me, she said, then set off back in the direction Lena had come from. Every ounce of Lena's being wanted to flee instead, but Torva wasn't a woman you disobeyed. Lena fell in line behind her, her fear increasing every step they took closer to the stairs. The stranger had gone when they ascended the steps, but she felt no relief at the realization. Lena knew where Torva was taking her, and it wasn't some place she was ready to go. The king's eyes followed her as they approached, and Lena tried hard not to noticeably tremble. Torva came to a stop behind the king's left shoulder. Lena peeked around the redhead, her eyes running down the length of the table at which the king sat at the head. Richly dressed men and women stared at her, with varying expressions ranging from interest to disdain. Then she saw the man sitting at the king's right hand. It was the stranger who had accosted her earlier. His eyes met hers, and he grimaced, as if overcome with disgust. Lena wanted badly to know what he knew, but she didn't think she'd get a chance to find out. King Lyo stood, politely excusing himself from the table and promising to return before the dancing began. Then he moved past Torva and Lena to set off down a small set of stairs behind the throne. Torva gave her a shove forward, then followed behind her as Lena stumbled down the stairs before catching herself. Lyo set a measured pace, but his long strides had her scurrying to keep up. Soon the grass gave way to cobblestone as the king crossed the road a contingent of his royal guard following behind them. Lena felt like a bird in a cage, knowing whatever came next, she couldn't escape on her own. King Lyle stopped in front of a squat stone building across the street from a square. Two men in royal guard uniforms stood on either side of a heavy wooden door. One moved to open it for the king, then stood aside as Lyle walked through. Torva shoved Lena after him into a plain room where other guards and members of the Fey military were stationed. It was a guard outpost of some sort, she realized, swallowing hard. Lyre stepped to the center of the room, and it fell quiet. He looked at Torva, and his lackey sprang into action. Everyone out, the imposing redhead yelled, and guards and soldiers alike hurried to obey. Torva shut the door behind them and stood in front of it, hands crossed behind her back, back ramrod straight. She stared ahead at nothing, making Lena start to sweat. The king, on the other hand, stood there silent while his eyes inspected her, making her feel like he was seeing through her skin and into her inner workings. Lena licked her lips, trying hard not to fidget under the king's scrutiny. I wish I knew what he sees. The fey king was blessed with powerful magic, and she wasn't sure if it included the ability to read minds. Or pluck out memories. Who are you? he asked at last, his tone even. 
My name is Adelina, she replied, and that is all I know. He stood there for a moment, assessing her response. Where do you come from, Adelina? I wish I could answer that question, she replied truthfully. I'm afraid I have no memory of anything other than my name. Torva herself confirmed that with the eye. Torva didn't move a muscle at the mention of her name. She continued to stare into the distance, more statue than a living body. The king, however, began to pace. I've never trusted that demon, he shared. Although I do not doubt his abilities, one would be a fool to underestimate an off-worlder, especially a demonic one. Lena wasn't certain how to respond, so she didn't. Instead, focusing on getting her heartbeat under control, the king's demeanor wasn't what she'd expected. He wasn't getting angry, wasn't threatening her. He wasn't even attempting to probe her, read her thoughts, manipulate her into speaking. He merely studied her and made conversation. Did you enjoy the day's festivities? he asked in the same tone he might have used to ask about the weather or the health of her relatives. I did, she said, venturing a small smile. The market was amazing, full of interesting wares, and the food at the feast was excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Was it like an average king's day where you're from? I don't know, she said with a small shrug. This could have been the first king's day I've celebrated, or it could be the 20th. That's the problem with losing your memory. You can't be sure of even basic facts. That does sound difficult, he commiserated, and Lena found some of the tension leaving her. His understanding tone, his solicitousness, they were unexpectedly putting her at ease. It was strange what happened at the feast, wasn't it? he asked casually. You mean the gust of wind and the lights going out? Precisely, he agreed with a nod. I've been to more of these celebrations than I can count, and not once has anything like that happened. Doesn't it strike you as odd that it would happen now? Odd? she asked, looking at the floor, because his gaze once again felt heavy. If you mean that it would happen at all, I suppose it's odd. I mean that it would happen when you were in attendance, just like the powerful wave of magic that exploded from your hand that night on the rooftop. It's strange that these things are happening when you're around. Lena tried not to stammer. I, that is, I'm not sure, but... You have magic in you, yet you are driving Torva mad, saying you're unable to access it, to wield it. It was a mistake, she mumbled. That statue thing, it malfunctioned somehow. The king's calm demeanor slipped, and he frowned. I can feel it, so there's no use in denying it. I can feel your connection to what's going on. You're tied up in all of this. I just can't see how. She opened her mouth to deny it, to plead her case, to explain how it wasn't her fault, that she couldn't remember, that she didn't want to disappoint him. But he raised his hand and she held her tongue, shame and anxiety washing over her in waves that grew rougher and rougher. Did she send you? He whispered, his eyes filled with intensity. She? She asked softly, unsure of who he meant. If you're talking about the Lady Lynetta, I... He shook his head, his face hardening in a way that drove the fear inside her to terror. Lyre gave her one last look before moving past her to address Torva. Take her back to the academy, and don't let her outside the walls again. I will visit soon. Torva gave him a brisk nod, then opened the door for him. Lyre walked out into the night, and it felt like he took the air in the room with him. Lena took a ragged breath, understanding that something momentous had happened to her. Come on, Torva said, motioning to her. Let's go. Lena thought about running, but she knew it was hopeless. Not only would Torva use her magic to stop her, but she knew there was no way to outrun Lyre, even if she could best Torva. The king wasn't about to let her get away before he figured out her role in whatever had happened tonight. I had no role, she told herself, but it didn't feel true. The image of the mouth and the grass flashed into her mind, and she shivered, rubbing her arms to ward off the chill, even though the night was warm and pleasant. The grinning mouth full of teeth in the wilted brown grass that had seemed to be laughing at her. Where did the mouth come from, and what does it mean? More questions, she grumbled to herself. Always more questions and never answers. I'm not sure how much more I can take. 
Their footfalls echoed on the quiet streets, which had been deserted in favor of the celebration. It gave the night a menacing air, no more menacing than the king, she thought. King Lyre frightened her, but that wasn't the only emotion he engendered. His innate nobility made her want to trust him. He seemed like a confident ruler, sure of his authority, not someone who relied on brute strength or persuasive personality to keep his subjects in thrall. He led because he was a leader, and people wanted to follow him. Lena couldn't fault him. He was every inch a king. I've never seen someone with that air about them, she thought, although she was limited by her lack of memories. It's a regal air, an ancient one, fundamental. He was the oldest fay according to the law, the progenitor of all fay. I wonder how weary his head must be from wearing the crown for so long. A few moments later, the walls of the academy rose in front of her, and Lena felt panic claw at her insides. She was going in, but she didn't know when she'd be able to come out again. Everything inside her rebelled, but she forced herself to follow Torva through the door. It didn't take long to reach her small room. Two burly men were waiting beside her door, one in King's Blade Black and the other in the light blue of the military. Lena knew they were there to stay. Torva watched as she entered the room and turned back, expecting Torva to lecture her or to gloat at the king's reaction. Instead, the woman gave her a sharp smile and waggled her fingers at her. The door shut suddenly, propelled by Torva's magic. To Lena's ears, it sounded like the lid of her coffin being slammed shut. I might end my days locked up in this maze of a building, never learning the truth. Her body heavy with despair, Lena sank into her bed to weep. Chapter 11 She knew it was a dream because her body was not her own. It looked like her body, but when she attempted to move it, she realized she had no control. Lena looked out through the eyes that weren't hers, but the view was a familiar one. Somewhere south of the city, she was looking at a view of Exaria from a distance. It was similar enough to the memory of her own journey to the capital and the place they'd stopped to rest before completing their trek. Her gaze swung downward, a disorienting motion that gave her a moment of nausea, and Lena could tell that they were far from the ground. Below her, the shrubs and bushes of the forest seemed tiny. Unless I'm doll-sized, I'm really high up. The owner of the eyes shifted, and Lena realized they were in a tree. Hands gripped the bark as they suddenly sped down the tree, climbing with a speed that was almost incomprehensible. Before she knew it, they were on the ground and striding through the forest away from the view. The bodies stopped suddenly, and Lena saw that they'd reached a small pool of clear water. They leaned down to scoop up some water and lift it to their mouth, and Lena saw their reflection staring at her, exactly the same as her own, save for the pink eyes that looked back at her. Lena woke suddenly gasping. She hadn't had a dream like this for days, and it immediately had her unsettled. Her doppelganger was nearby. The dream had shown it. If I trust dreams like that, that is, she thought to herself, could the woman who looked so much like her really be stationed outside the capital? Was she hunting Lena down again, or was there another reason she might be lurking so close by? Lena pushed herself to her feet, already overwhelmed by frustration. Her dark mood clung to her like a cloud while she tramped to the mess hall for breakfast. Pigeon was already there and motioned her over. Lena took a seat, putting a piece of toast on her plate and spreading jam on it with ferocity. I think there's more jam than bread left, Pigeon pointed out. Lena let out a breath, abandoning the toast. I can't take this any more. Being cooped up here, waiting for the king to return. Will he use his magic to try and force answers out of me? Or will he throw me in the dungeon to rot? Or worse? I don't know what's worse than that. Pigeon said, dipping her spoon in her porridge and lifting it to her mouth. Maybe an eternity cleaning dairy cow stalls? I've got to talk to the eye again. She'd been mulling over a plan since King's Day, a way of finding out the truth about herself. It wasn't something she was looking forward to, but at this point, she was out of options. Pigeon blanched and dropped her spoon, splashing porridge on the table. No one wants to talk to the eye, she said, leaning in to whisper the words. That thing is evil. I feel sick just watching it walk by me. It's not something I want. 
but the alternative is waiting for King Lao to drop the hammer. I would rather take my destiny into my own hands. Are you certain? What if the eye makes things worse? She told Pigeon about what had happened that night, about what she saw and felt when the lights flashed off. Her friend had helped to calm her, and Lena appreciated her being someone she could rely on. But she hadn't considered a negative outcome from a visit to the eye, which showed how much things had changed. I'm not sure what could be worse at this point. The leader of the realm doesn't trust me, and has imprisoned me here, with guards dogging my every step. She pointed to today's pair, who stood a few paces off, eating without taking their eyes off her. Speaking of your constant companions, have you given any thought of how you're going to give them the slip? Pigeon's question was a good one. I've given it a lot of thought to it, but I haven't come up with the means to accomplish it. I might have an idea, Pigeon drawled. I've made friends with that one, she said, discreetly pointing out the more slender and younger of the pair in the King's Blade uniform. His name is Parsif, and it turns out we share an interest in gardening. He's from a village not far from mine, she frowned. I don't know what to do about the soldier, however. Are you saying what I think you're saying, Lena said, holding her breath while she waited for an answer. I will distract Parsif when you are ready to give this plan a shot. You're the best, Lena said with a grin, the situation no longer seeming as hopeless as before. We're going to have to be flexible and take our shot when the opportunity presents itself. If I give you the signal, you glue yourself to Parsif's side and talk about gardening and dairy cows, okay? What signal? Pigeon asked. They settled on a fake sneeze. Lena hurried to finish breakfast, remembering that they had combat practice that afternoon and she'd need the energy. Silix was as demanding as ever that afternoon, but Lena relished the opportunity to use her body and release her pent-up frustration. As usual, Bracken was there, volunteering to be her sparring partner and save her cohort from having to challenge her. She'd become comfortable practicing with the Velix, and they'd fall immediately into their patterns of running forms. Her fighting skills had improved under Silix's tutorage and Bracken's instruction, but she was still outclassed by the soldier when it came to speed. I had another dream, she said, as much to distract him and catch him off guard as to inform him. It didn't work, and he managed to trip her before asking her to describe what had happened in the dream. I was seeing through her eyes, my double, as she looked at the capital from the south, She's close. That's assuming what you see in these dreams reflects reality. It could just be a dream after all. Or it could be someone's magic messing with me. Believe me, I've thought about the possibilities. She blocked his punch, then he blocked hers, but she managed to land a kick to his shin. He hissed, then swiveled around her to put her in a hold. And you believe she's close? She couldn't nod in the position he had her in, so she shifted her weight to throw him. It didn't come off as well as she hoped, but Lena did manage to dislodge his hold. I feel like I'm stuck between waiting on the king to come back and interrogate me again, or waiting for my doppelganger to show up and let loose chaos again. Neither seemed like strong options. Lena had told him about the fallout from King's Day, and he hadn't taken it well, but he'd kept his opinions to himself. I'll agree with that, Bracken said, then threw out his arm with lightning speed. She barely managed to block it, and the four blows that followed. Good. Then you'll agree with the plan I've come up with. I'm going to talk to the eye again. Bracken froze at her words, giving Lena the chance to land a punch on his chin. He rocked back, then folded his arms over his chest. Wasn't talking to the eye my idea, he said. I'll give you all the credit you want if you can help me pull it off. Lena worked on catching her breath as Brecken thought it over. I'll help, he said at last, but only because I've got some disturbing news of my own. What? Lena asked, instantly on edge. She didn't know what he was going to say, only that it was going to be bad. Lynetta Camara is back in Exaria, and she's brought her fiancé with her. Fiancé? Lena couldn't believe what she was hearing. She disappears for months and returns with a fiancé? Isn't that a little suspicious? It could be, which is why we need to figure out what's going on. 
She'd told Bracken about the man who'd accosted her on King's Day, accusing her of having something to do with Lynetta's disappearance. He knew that meant Lena had a connection to the noblewoman, even if they still did not know the nature of that connection. So, how do we get me away from my guardians and in front of the eye? We don't do anything. I will convince the soldier to trade places with me, then we'll figure out some kind of distraction for your king's blade or guardian. Already ahead of you, Lena told him. Pigeon is friendly with him. She's agreed to help distract him when the time comes. Looks like you really have given this some thought. Bracken's voice held a note of approval that had her beaming. We've got to move fast, though, because the Lady Lynetta's return has already set off a firestorm among the nobility. If you're going to make a move, it should be today. Now! Lena glanced around to see that the other pairs were breaking up and that Silix was wrapping up the session. Okay, she said with a nod. You swap duties with the soldier, and Pigeon will take care of the rest. She moved over to her friend, who was griping about the unfairness of exercise. Shouldn't energy be saved and not wasted on unnecessary movement, she grumbled, wiping the sweat off her forehead with the back of her hand. Lena leaned in to speak softly into her ear. Bracken is going to take the place of the soldier set to guard me. Once he has, you're on parsip duty. Got it, Pigeon said with a decisive nod. She looked a little green at the gills, but... Lena had to trust her to come through. Lena then moved close enough to Bracken to overhear his conversation with the guard. Everything hinged on him convincing the soldier to agree. Looks like someone got the posh assignment, he started in a jealous tone. Standing around all day watching a girl who never goes anywhere or does anything. How do I get a gig like that? The soldier shrugged. You could try not being born into the wrong family, he said in evil glint in his eye. Or... Are you so eager to desert your post now because the work is a little hard? But then, I guess it runs in the family. Lena frowned, wondering what the man meant. Bracken ignored the man's words, pushing forward with the plan. I guess that means you're not interested in the little tidbit I heard earlier from the guys in the barracks. Something about your favorite girl at the House of Earthly Delights? Miranda? The guard asked quickly, the tips of his ears flushing red. She's back. Bracken said casually. I was going to offer to cover your cushy post, giving you the rest of the afternoon off, but I suppose you wouldn't want to desert your post. The soldier gave him a wolfy grin, patting him on the chest. Sure, pal. I'd be glad to let you cover, just as soon as you tell me what you want in exchange. Make the morning delivery to Roxy for me tomorrow. I'm on her bad side at the moment, and I don't feel like another tongue lashing. You got it, the man said, then straightened his uniform. Miranda, honey, here I come. He lit out of the practice field like his backside was on fire. Lena would have laughed, but she was too busy being annoyed. The House of Earthly Delights? Is that what I think it is? It's a brothel, Bracken admitted. He's been hung up on a girl there, that poor fool. And how about you? How many nights have you spent with the ladies of the evening? Bracken looked at her, arching an eyebrow. There's that jealousy again. He put a hand on her shoulder. Don't worry. You're the only lady I'm interested in at the moment. His words sent her pulse racing. Now let's focus. It's time to see a demon about a certain matter of your lost memories. Chapter 12 Lena and Pigeon were heading in the direction of the bars, as was their custom after their mid-afternoon combat practice sessions. Parsa and Bracken trailed a few feet behind them, like shadows cast on the stone floor. Lena was filled with anxiety, knowing that everything hinged on the next few minutes. Pigeon was talking about bathing on the farm. Father carved a wooden tub with his own hands. Thankfully he used it for years before I came along, so it's rare to get a splinter from it nowadays. I can't tell you how bad a splinter in an awkward place can hurt. She was speaking more quickly and erratically than usual. Her nerves obviously getting to her as well. Up ahead, Lena could see where the hallways branched. Yes, now or never. She let out a high-pitched fake sneeze and Pigeon's eyes widened. Oh my, it sounds like you're coming down with something. I'd better move back or I might end up with whatever you have. Pigeon dropped back, moving to Parsif's side. Lena heard her friend strike up a conversation with the young king's blade, asking about how big his garden back home was. Bracken sped up his pace until he was alongside her. 
They walked in silence as Pigeon continued her conversation. Lena kept stealing glances at the pair, noticing that Pigeon was slowing her pace as they walked. She didn't follow much of their conversation, only noting that it involved growing a hard-to-cultivate herb and the best way to ensure its thriving. Her heart was beating at a furious rate, and Lena knew it was time to act. Just before they reached the branch in the corridor, Lena looked over her shoulder. Parsif appeared engrossed in conversation with an animated pigeon, who was painting a picture with her words and gestures. Lena took Bracken's arm and pulled him down the corridor to the right, tucking him into a doorway and crouching beside him. She watched as Parsif and Pigeon continued moving forward. The Kingsblade was so distracted, he hadn't noticed that they were now alone in the corridor. It worked, Lena realized, letting out a breath as Pigeon and Parsif disappeared from sight. Come on, Brecken said, wasting no time setting off down the hallway. He set a grueling pace, and she was sprinting to keep up. We don't have much time. Parsif might not be the most observant, but he'll eventually notice that we're gone. Lena had yet to learn the layout of the academy, its massive size, and her own structured and supervised schedule combining to keep her to a few well-used hallways. She relied on Bracken now to lead her through the corridors as they doubled back to their destination. The eye dwells in the South Tower, Bracken told her as he checked the hall in front of them for anyone who might see them. Making sure the corridor was empty, he motioned for her to follow him across an arched opening. Stone stairs spiraled upward, and Bracken took them two at a time. Lena struggled to keep up as they climbed and climbed. Although she was starting to sweat, she noticed that the air seemed to cool the higher they went. By the time they reached the top, Lena could see her breath as it fogged out in front of her. They paused at the landing where the stairs ended. Both sets of eyes on their heavy wooden door in front of them. It was ajar, and she could feel cold air streaming from the crack. I'm frightened. She hugged herself, willing herself to approach, but having trouble making her muscles react. Bracken looked at her, then took a step forward, raising his fist to knock on the door. Before he could touch it, a voice called out from inside. Enter! Pushing the door open, Bracken stepped inside. Lena forced herself forward, following him into a spacious chamber. Not only was it freezing cold, but it was unkempt, dust and cobwebs covering nearly every surface. The furnishings were old and in bad repair, mostly rickety chairs and lopsided tables. Lena looked around and noticed that she saw no bed. Standing in front of a wide window in the far wall, the eye was little more than a silhouette. I expected you to come. His voice was creaky, as if he spent long stretches not talking. Lena's skin was crawling, already just being in the vicinity of the hellspawn. He stepped into the light, revealing his ash-gray skin and single visible milky-white eye. But this time, his eye patch was missing, revealing what it had been hiding. It took everything inside her not to turn away and run back out of the tower. His other eye was sewn shut with thick black cord that showed signs of extreme age. Her stomach lurched when she realized the eye itself must be missing. You're correct, the demon replied, putting an index finger near his eye. This was my sacrifice to receive my powers. One type of sight for another. The knowledge that he'd given his eye up willingly rocked her. Lena started to tremble, fear overwhelming her. Bracken moved closer to her, stopping short of putting an arm around her, but his closeness was calming nonetheless. With this silent support, she was able to push past the fright and focus. If you knew I was coming, then you also know what I'm about to ask, she said, surprised at the strength she heard in her own voice. I do. But removing your block is not within my power to do. He moved to a chair that wobbled when he sat. Lena saw that his movements were different. They weren't jerky or jumpy because his bodily motions were smooth and practiced, but it was as if her perception of his movements was flawed. He seemed to be one place, then suddenly forward, as if she'd taken a slow blink in between, but she hadn't. It was unnerving, but Lena put it out of her mind. Are you saying you cannot help her, or you aren't willing to? Bracken wasn't able to remain quiet for long. His voice was laced with a barely restrained hostility. Whether or not I would be willing to help if I could is an interesting question, 
but one I won't bother with. The block was put there using a power I've seen only once before. Alas, my own paltry powers are no match for the one who put your block in place. Who was it? Lena asked, her voice hoarse. Who did this to me? The answer I have for you is one you'll find unsatisfactory. So you don't know, Bracken Scott, and you can't help. On the contrary, I know more than you can comprehend. The hellspawn stiffened, and Lena could tell that the creature's patience was fraying. The one you're looking for is the Eater of Worlds, and it will take tremendous power to undo his work. At the name, the image of the gaping, tooth-filled mouth burst into her brain, making her wince. The Eater of Worlds, she thought, her chest freezing so that it almost hurt to draw breath. That's who has stolen my memories away. That can't be it, Bracken growled, his anger overflowing. Some made-up name meant to throw us off the track. I think maybe you can remove the block, and you're toying with her, he fingered the hilt of his rapier. Does Torva know of your treachery? The eye turned his milky gaze onto Bracken, no fear in his countenance. If anything, there was a hint of a smile. I do not serve Torva. Is that so? Because most of the Academy believes she keeps you as some kind of pet. Bracken was kneeling the creature, perhaps as a strategy, but more likely because he was infuriated. It has suited my needs to be here, the demon replied calmly. Much as you are here when technically you should not be. Tell her who did this, then, and no silly epitaphs. Who did this? Bracken was rigid with fury and impatience. Lena put a hand on his arm to steady him. She knew that things were spiraling out of hand, and she had yet to determine how to remove her block and regain her memories. Please, she said, hoping she could turn the tide. If you aren't able to help me, maybe you could tell me who can. It would take tremendous power to remove the block, he replied, his gaze back on her, making her skin crawl all over again. And those with the power needed to remove the block often do not realize it because they've been blocked. What? Lena said, shaken. Could he mean what I think he means? That I have the power to remove my own block? Stop toying with her, Bracken snarled. We came for answers. And I've given them. The eye focused on the angry Velux, his eye narrowing. I'm not the one hiding things. Afraid she'll know your secret shame. Lena looked at Bracken, startled. Her companion bristled, every muscle in his body tensing. You're an abomination that should be exiled from the realm. You know a lot about exile, the eye replied. A very little about acceptance. The hellspawn stood, moving forward in a sudden and instantaneous manner. One moment he was beside the chair, and the next he was standing inches away from them. Lena felt the sensation she had last time, that her insides were being forced open. The eye peered into hers, and Lena winced at the pain. That's interesting, he murmured, leaning in till she could smell the sulfur on his breath. You're closer than I thought. Lena got the feeling he wasn't talking to her. Stop, she whispered, but she could feel the metal claws digging deeper, peeling her open layer by layer. Ah, she doesn't know it works both ways, the hellspawn laughed, and it was the most chilling sound Lena had ever heard. She started stepping away from the demon and closing her eyes. She has a message for you, the eyes said, addressing Lena again. She says she's you, remember? The words were familiar, like the memory of a dream. Lena felt the pain stop and almost collapse from a relief. Bracken pulled her behind him, puffing out his chest. Leave her alone, he snarled. We came for help, and you've told us nothing. I've told you everything. You just don't know it yet. Bracken shook his head. Who or what is the Eater of Worlds? The demon smiled. He'll find out soon enough. Then he vanished. Chapter 13 Lena was shaking so hard she kept her hand on the wall while they walked down the tower steps to prevent a fall. She was glad to get away from the eyes chamber, but the meeting had left her unsettled. 
How did the eye disappear like that? She asked, as much to herself as Bracken. Some hell spawn can teleport, he replied through gritted teeth. But it's a rare talent. Just another surprise for my demon friend. The meeting hadn't gone as she'd hoped. Her block was still firmly in place, and the eye had offered no means to remove it. But he had put a name to her nemesis. The Eater of Worlds. It was a menacing name and a powerful one. I have to go. Now, get out of the city while I have the chance. Bracken looked back over his shoulder at her, his face full of concern. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I'm out of options, she insisted. Something terrible is going to happen, and I don't want to be a part of it. The eye had been speaking to someone inside her. She knew. Lena thought it might be her doppelganger he'd seen, since she'd been able to see through the woman's eyes in her dream. He said that it works both ways, which means she can see through my eyes too. Is she watching me now? Lena, I know you're upset, but you can't react suddenly out of fear. We don't have enough information yet to say how you're involved in all of this. Bracken's words were reasonable, but she could tell he was struggling as well. They reached the bottom of the stairs and Bracken turned to her. He put a finger under her chin and lifted her eyes to his. It's too dangerous to send you off on your own. Not without figuring out some things first. We need to talk to Lynetta Camara. Maybe she can tell us what happened. I can't wait around to get a chance to talk to the woman. What are the odds she'll show up at the academy when I'm around? Lena shook her head. I need out of here. Tonight, he said, putting a hand on her arm to soothe her. I'll smuggle you out tonight. Just make sure you're ready. There you are. Lena turned her head at the angry tone. Parsif was barreling toward them, a distraught pigeon falling behind. You slipped away, he accused. Lena shook her head. I made a wrong turn. It's easy to get lost in this place. We were just retracing our steps, looking for you. Parsif's eyebrows rose. It was clear he doubted her words. It's my fault, Brecken said, stepping forward. We were arguing over the proper way to do a throw, and I didn't realize we'd gotten separated. While I was lost in conversation, we became lost, literally. Parsif let out a huff of air, then softened. It's okay. The same thing happened to us. Let's make sure to pay more attention next time, and neither of us needs to report the little mix-up to our superiors. Agreed, Bracken said, shaking the King's Blade's hand. Now, let's get this lady where she's supposed to be going. Her pet sounds heavenly before dinner, Pigeon sighed. I'm afraid Lena no longer has time for that, Parsif said. She's late for her one-on-one -on -one with Torva. Another one-on-one, -on -one, Lena asked, frustration seeping into her voice. That woman is nothing if not tenacious. They don't call her Torva the Heartless for nothing, Bracken said softly. People call her that? Pigeon asked, scandalized. Not where she can hear it, Parsif said with a grin. Why not? She'd probably take it as a badge of honor, Lena grumbled. She gave Pigeon a wave, saying she'd see her at dinner. That is, if Torva lets me go in time to eat. Pigeon gave her a sympathetic smile, then set off in the direction of the baths. Lena took a breath, then fell in line with Parsif and Bracken on either side of her. Every step toward Torva's office felt like a step toward her doom. No matter what I try, I can't seem to disentangle myself from this web of misery. Even the eye can't help me, and he can teleport at will and read minds. The Hellspawn had talked about someone more powerful being needed to remove her block, but the creature's powers were far more advanced than most of the ones she'd seen in the academy, save maybe Tolva's. The leader of the King's Blade was waiting in her doorway when they arrived. What kept you? She asked, her tone deceptively level for the intensity in her ice-blue eyes. It was my fault, Bracken said, taking the fall. I stopped to chat with a friend and lost track of time. Torva eyed him. If you've not been assigned this rotation, Velix, only soldiers I trust are on this detail. Why are you here? Lena winced. Torva the Heartless is right. There was an emergency that required the soldier assigned to this detail. I took over his duties just for the afternoon. His posture was stiff, but he managed to keep any hint of confrontation out of his voice. 
which was a victory for him, considering how quick Brecken was to anger. Report to your superior officer, Torva commanded. Tell him I don't want you in my academy again. Understood. Lena went pale, panic gripping her. Brecken's eyes narrowed, and for a moment Lena thought he might argue. Instead, he gave a short nod, then turned on his heel and departed. Torva moved into her office and beckoned Lena to follow, then closed the door behind her. Lena's heart dropped into her stomach like a stone down a deep well. Where were we? Torva asked, rubbing her hands together enthusiastically. About to engage in yet another useless exchange, Lena said, unable to hold back her feelings. She tried submitting to Torva, going along with what the stronger woman wanted, and it had gotten her nowhere. After her visit to the eye, she no longer had the patience to accept her treatment silently. Torva's eyebrow arched. I can see we're going to have some fun today. Is that how you see it genuinely? The floodgates inside her opened, and Lena said things she'd been holding inside for weeks. Is torturing me entertainment for you? Pushing me to my limits just to uncover nothing? When will you admit that you were wrong? That I don't have these powers? That I am a victim of the whims of fate? Never, her adversary said simply. Thou brace yourself. I've gone easy on you before. You've done nothing of the sort, Lena exclaimed. But today I'm going to crack you open like an egg until your power bleeds out. It will go easier if you open yourself to me. I'm not fighting you. I haven't fought you once during this entire process, Lena protested. Either I have no powers or I cannot access them. End of story. Ice blue eyes trained themselves on Lena and suddenly she was lifted into the air. Electricity crackled around her, lightning bouncing off the walls of the chamber. You will either show your power, or you will be destroyed in the process. Torva's voice was flat, almost objective. Lena felt sick to her stomach as fear sliced into her. Suddenly, the roof exploded above her, letting in the sky. Clouds gathered above her, flashing with light as a storm darkened the world around Lena. Winds whipped through her robes as she was lifted higher, out through the hole in the roof. When the first bolt of lightning hit her, she screamed. Her hair fizzled around her head, crackling with electricity. Lena fought to control her body, to escape the storm, but she was propelled upward, heading for the storm clouds where the lightning was waiting for her. Over and over the bolts hit her, frying her brains, burning like fire. Over and over she screamed, helpless to escape the onslaught. After a few minutes, she lost count of the number of lightning bolts that lit her up. In agony, Lena hung on, hoping only to survive. The weightlessness she experienced vanished without warning, and she was falling, huddling toward the academy's roof with startling speed. She hit the impact, shattering bones and rupturing muscle. Lena let out a moan, then felt herself rolled along the roof tiles until she fell through the hole she'd been lifted out of. She landed at Torva's feet, feeling broken beyond repair. A flick of the heartless woman's wrist had her back on her feet. She stood, realizing that her body was intact. Lena looked up at the roof and found it was solid as ever. It was an illusion, she realized, although the memory of the pain it had caused remained. The pain was real. This was only the first wave, it turned out. Torva tried extreme cold next, leaving Lena naked in a field of snow. Her feet were cracked and bleeding as she walked across the icy landscape looking for an exit as the blizzard blasted the snowdrifts around her. She finally gave up, lying in the snow and waiting for the numbness that would signal her end. Torva pulled her out before it came, only to thrust her into the middle of the ocean. Lena gasped as she fell beneath the waves, struggling to return to the surface. There was nothing around her, no driftwood to grab onto, no ship on the horizon, only endless miles of ocean. She treaded water, not bothering to expend more energy than what was needed to stay afloat. The water around her shifted, and she turned to see a massive wave on the horizon, taller than the tallest hill. Lena inhaled deeply, waiting for the impact. When it hit, it drove her deep under the surface, rolling her so that she couldn't tell which direction the surface was in. She swam frantically, her lungs screaming for air. She was on the verge of passing out when the scene around her changed again. She landed on the floor of Tova's office, choking up a mouthful of salty water. 
Enough, she cried, half in anger and half in desperation. Lena was on the verge of begging the woman to release her, but when Torva smiled down at her with a malicious grin, she knew there was no point. We're just getting started, Torva said with a laugh, poking Lena with her foot. Exhausted and bruised, Lena looked up at her with the realization that it would never be over. She would be at the redhead's mercy forever, subjected to more and more brutal torture until she broke. This is what traitors can expect, Torva said, her voice cold. This and worse. Lena didn't know what worse could be, but she was certain of one thing. Torva would make sure she found out. <laughs>